Whoa. <laughs> Hey, Emma. Hello. Hey, I, I've hoodwinked you. You know why? Yeah. Hello. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, I hoodwinked you. Um, Rick Servin, our Greek teacher, mm -hmm. he, he's got some health issues, so he's not going to join oh. us. And so this is going to turn into a just chatting. Oh. So, sorry. Well, I'll hang out for a little bit It'd and then... Great. I might have to go read Greek. <laughs> <laughs> so do you know Greek? Yeah. Well, okay. I failed my Greek exam. Okay. I need to pass it in the fall. Oh, so you're doing it now? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I know Greek, but not as well as I should. Okay. I'm So I'm like halfway through your, um, uh, your, your conversation with uh, Paul. Right now oh yeah so on the way home from work i was listening to that um so i i presume probably toward the end of that you get into where you're at now so i don't know what, what are you doing you're... i don't actually that well somewhere in the middle i get into it okay. um i'm in grad school for classics i'm working on a phd oh okay so, so rick rick is a um phd in linguistics okay. with a focus on classics Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, he'll be coming at it from a somewhat different angle, but mm -hmm. oh, there's sure. a lot of overlap for sure. Yeah, if you check out the um, Discord, um, his earlier handout kind of goes into where he's coming from and yeah, how he approaches things, and sure. could be might be pretty interesting to you. Yeah. Anybody, yeah, and so uh, anybody who's uh, watching right now, the um, if you go into the live chat, the link to join the stream is pasted there. So if you want to join in, please go ahead and do it. Um, yeah, so uh, so Rick, uh, oh, did you find it? I did, yeah. Okay. I can read it later, though. Okay, cool. So so you're doing, um, you're getting a, a, a master's degree in classics, you said? I am getting a PhD. Yeah. I, okay. I have a master's in Latin now. I think. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and so you're doing, and where are you studying? I'm in Illinois. Okay. And what school are you at? Uh, University of Illinois. Okay. Actually, I think that's where Rick Servan got his PhD, was University oh. of Illinois. Um, like we have a pretty strong linguistics department and a strong classics department. Mm. So. One of my favorite undergrad professors also got his PhD here. Which okay. Was part of why I applied. So. Gotcha. And um, so you're just you're interested. Have you always been interested in classics? Pretty much. Um, I've been taking Latin since like fourth grade. Mm -hmm. So I've always kind of been into that, and then I'm not as interested in Greek but it's growing okay. on me. Okay. Um, um, at Hillsdale, there was always kind of a split between the Catholics who were more interested in Latin and the Protestants who really wanted to know Greek so they could read the Bible in the original or the yeah. New Testament in the original. Okay. Um, which was always kind of funny. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I was listening to the rest of the conversation today. Um, you guys got into uh, the oh uh, yeah the Latin mass I conversation. Like, I was bummed that I didn't get to stick around for that. Um, not that I have the insight on it, but 
Um, let me close this door real quick. So, I when I, I grew up uh, Protestant. Are you are you cradle Catholic? You must be. Having said that, technically, okay. strictly speaking, technically no, but basically yes. I okay. my I was baptized Lutheran because my mom had sort of drifted away from Catholicism at that point. My dad was Lutheran. Mm. Uh, but then like when I was two, um, she sort of came back and I was received into the church. And then two years later, he also became Catholic. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember being Protestant, but technically I was baptized Protestant. Gotcha. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, I'm, a evangelical slash fundamentalist background. Um, I went okay. to a fundamentalist um, Christian school in elementary and junior high and uh, freshman year of high school. Why is Discord beeping at me? It just keeps on going. I'm going to just turn it off. Stop. Um, yeah, it, it uh, so that's where I come from. And I went to a couple of Catholic weddings. One was like a Mexican Catholic wedding and another was not. And uh, it was like Novus Ordo or something, but I didn't. Um, it didn't strike me as weird at all. It didn't strike me as. I mean, I had been trained in very anti-Catholic ideology, um, but nothing struck me as either positive yeah. or negative. It was just sort of okay. That's why a lot of people don't like the Novus Ordo. Okay, a lot. That's maybe inflating the number of it probably masters that are it relative, there, relatively but. familiar ish, I think. Um I mean relatively compared to where I have ended up. <laughs> but um the and then um I became started getting into orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy when I was in um college hmm. and um I've where'd been, you go where to go to college mm -hmm. i went to sacramento state csu sacramento um i'm a mechanical engineer nice. and, yeah and so i was I think it was a junior or, or my maybe my fourth year at sac state when i was uh officially became a orthodox so it's been 15 years and oh, wow. um, in the meantime, uh, numerous of my, my, our family friends have eventually become Orthodox, um, one way or another, some, many of them, several of them through, um, my mom, you know, uh, a friend of ours, she, our family, a friend of ours, they became, um, Catholic and there was another guy actually as my boss. And there was another guy who was like one of our clients and he was an SSPX guy. Oh. And, um, and so my boss got involved with the SSPX and then eventually they had a falling out. So they didn't go to SSPX anymore, but they went to the local TLM parish in Sacramento. And um, so again, like I said, my, my exposure to Catholicism was very minimal. I did not have a very strong like anti-Catholic um, bent, um, even though kind of, because I mean, I, I kind of, after I became Orthodox, I was sort of like, well, there's a lot of similarities and, you know, some of the things that I would have been very uh, opposed to now I'm not, I'm much more receptive to, right? So um, the, uh, I went to a um, Novus Ordo low mass though at, and I was like shocked. a daily mass, I guess. I mean, it was, it was very short. It's probably three, 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and at, this is some years after I became Orthodox and I was just like shocked. I was just like, what is this? You know, I was like, what are you, what are these guys doing? You know, just to me, it was, it was very, very off putting because of the informality. And, mm. um, and then I went to uh, um, uh, two weddings and a funeral. Well, the funeral was recent, but the um, two weddings over the years at the um, TLM parish. And I was just like, if I was Catholic, this is where I would be. 
I mean, it was just like, no, hands down, no question. This is where I would be at. Um, but the, the other thing about it was the, the language part of it, because um, in Eastern Orthodoxy, we don't have like a attachment to language so much. I mean, mm-hmm. some do. There is some of that, but it's not in the same way that it is in the like the TLM community. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not like a doctrinal or like not a justification. I mean, some people do try to make a justification like, oh, it's got to be Greek because of X, Y, Z. But um, by and large, that's not like a, it's not taken seriously because historically in Eastern Orthodoxy, um, it had been always translated into local language um, right. throughout his. So that's just sort of not, it's not as, um, it's not, it doesn't get a lot of traction except in like very ethnic communities where right. they like preserve their ethnicity and that's part of it. Um, but it's not like a, it's not like the same thing. So that was kind of the thing that um, I, I kind of thought that was strange about the, the Latin mass stuff was just the language part of it, but the overall tradition and the, and the, the liturgy and the tradition of it, I was just like, this is a hundred percent. If I was Catholic, this is where I'd be a hundred percent. Well, it's not all that far off from the Greek Orthodox divine liturgy. It's not right. In a lot of ways. Um, it is, it's funny because, like, you know, if I were in charge of things, I think it would be really cool to have, like, keep the Tridentine form and just translate it all. To English. Why, and why is that not a thing? Like, why? I would Because when they were doing the translating, they also decided to simplify it because there was a lot of repetition and, um, like, they felt that it was overly formal and Vatican II was just a very messy council in a lot of ways. Yeah. So they decided that as part of translating it, they would also write a new mass. That's, it's such a foreign concept to me to even yeah. begin to think about doing something like that. It's such a, like a, what? what? <laughs> Changing the liturgy? We would never ever, <laughs> but it's not true because it changes all the time. And it's mm-hmm. tons of, if you go to, um, so I don't know, I'm, I don't know how it is in, in the traditional Latin mass, probably from parish to parish. I imagine if you're into it, you start to see the distinct distinctions. I'm sure you do, but yeah, I've only been to like two parishes ever. So in, uh, like Orthodoxy, Latin mass yeah, in Orthodoxy, the local variations are, I mean, to me, they're very, it's like huge, hugely different. Um, but it's different. And prob- probably somebody who is not familiar with it would may not notice the difference as much. But to me, it's probably like you know, there's tons of variation. And, you know, local traditions and local things change. And there is like a lot of, there's a lot of wiggle room. There's tons of wiggle mm-hmm. room. You know, they, w- they, they move things around. They do things, you know, are you going to do the sermon at this point? Are they going to do the sermon at that point? It's like pretty messy. I will say that. Like the Orthodox Divine Liturgy is, in terms of how it's practiced locally, it can be messy um in terms of variation so there's there's not like a a very 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 strict regulation in that regard mm-hmm. and i imagine it might be stricter in the it probably is that's kind of our like if you're going by stereotypes that's kind of our thing yeah um the west likes their regulations hmm. and and minimal requir- minimum requirements Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so there probably is somewhat less change, but there's also probably more than some hardline Latin mass people will tell you there. Yeah. There could be. Um, yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird, messy split um, within the church. And I think it's much messier online than it is if you're talking to people in real life, too. How do you mean? Um, like you get a lot of YouTube people who are very like, like have very strong opinions and like state things very categorically. And then you sort of get the, the, the feeling that like, that's how most people who like the Latin mass think. And then you talk to like your average person who goes to the Latin mass and they're not like that. They just like somewhat prefer it. Or like, 
you know, dislike X, Y, Z about the new mass or whatever. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Um, but online you kind of get people that sometimes seem like they're they're setting people up to just leave Catholicism for their own because they think they know it better. Um, like with SSPX. Mm. Oh yeah. Stuff like that. That's a big it's a mm -hmm. big controversy right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, so from my very little exposure on the internet to Latin mass trad people, um, I don't hear much about SSPX lately. Is that just, is, is, that, is that, uh, that's fortunate. <laughs> okay. But I do hear a lot about TLM, but more like the legit TLM, which is now, now the people that I were following that were into it. Now there are a lot of complaints because their parishes got shut down. Um, yeah, that's been happening a lot. I don't know what's happening here in Sacramento, but, um, yeah, my friend's parish is getting, well, it's not getting shut down exactly. It's getting moved like a little bit further away to an oratory instead of a parish, which I don't know how big a difference that is. Hmm. Um, but they're frustrated, of course, because uh, when uh, your perfectly stable parish gets messed with for seemingly no reason, it's frustrating. Yeah. Well, I would be, I would be, I would be highly upset if I was, if I was a member of one of those parishes, if like, you know, as, as long as things carried on, I'd be cool. But as soon as it came and, and they took away my church or, well, I guess I should say took away the, the liturgy that, I mean, I'd be convinced, like I'm convinced that the traditional Latin mass is like, that's <laughs> as an outsider, I'm just like, that's it. That's the, <laughs> that's the liturgy, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and I would be, you know, I would probably be looking for, I don't know, I'd be looking for some way to, I don't know, it would be like a make or break thing for me if I was Catholic. Yeah, it's shaking up a whole community too. Oh yeah. And it wouldn't be just like, like, oh, I prefer this. It'd be like, no, this is, this is the legit way. So, you know, then you're, I don't know. Well, yeah, that you're really not supposed to think that if you're Catholic. I know. I know. <laughs> That's the thing that would really that that would frustrate me, but I'd be able, I'd be okay with that as long as I was locally able to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. There and there are a lot of people in that situation, and there's a lot of debate over whether it's better to like leave well enough alone, or whether those communities sort of over time drift into being basically like dissenting from the tr like i've heard arguments that um if you leave a tlm parish alone for too long it basically like gets infected with sspx ideas basically i think that, that um that's like not the like most gracious way i can put that argument but it's the best way I can think of to say it right now. So it sounds, it sounds fairly traditional to me in the sense that uh, that's kind of what Charlemagne was doing, right? He was standardizing and and trying to um, trying to bring uh, order, trying to bring a um, uh, consistency. A measure of consistency. Yeah, that's true. And so that sounds like very much within Ironically. the tradition of Catholicism to be looking for that kind of tradition. Consistency. They, they do... <sighs> Consistency is important, especially if you're, you know, your church contains people all over the world. Yeah. And you want them to all feel like they're part of the same church. Um, the, I mean, it's Pajot's center and margins problem again, right? You, mm -hmm. you need to like pull people towards the center enough that you have a thing but not squish the margins so hard that like they rebel and destroy everything yes yeah and within you know for sure like within eastern orthodoxy there's like you know like i said there's so much variation and and 
bordering on or even stepping over the line in terms of abuse of uh, what's proper um, that happens all over the place. And, you know, if you're if you're looking for like absolute purity, you'd be very scandalized about the kinds of things mm-hmm. that, that go on, you know. So anyway, I've hung out a lot of your enough of your guys' dirty laundry. So sorry about that. You've been gracious. <laughs> it's all right. It's we've got plenty of it. It's a topic of interest to me sometimes yeah. in an actual like, you know, like I, I wish this could be solved more easily than it has been. And sometimes in a like what are crazy people on the internet saying today? sort of way yeah um like guilty pleasure sort of thing oh Um, yeah hang on a second i'm gonna call my buddy george he george was on yesterday you met george yes yeah he's trying to get in but i think he's having trouble okay um hey george are you are, are you on youtube uh huh. I I don't see you waiting. Um, if you go into the live chat on YouTube, there's I just put a link there, the Streamyard link for you to join. Yeah, you're on YouTube, and then you click into the live chat, and that's where the link to actually join the stream is. So. Okay, and and there's a. Riveting TV. I'm not familiar with that, so bear with me. Okay. Uh, do I need to search for that? Um, uh, live. There's, there's a live. Yeah. If you click the um, if you click the link I sent you, that brings you to the YouTube, and then. Well, the the link. Okay. What you sent me though is which is on my iPhone. Mm. And, you mean email so, it? If you were to send send it to me. But what I did is I just sent it to my email address. Okay. And that's where I'm at. Hey, I'm, I'm sending you the link to email. So, okay. Just uh, okay. click, click this link. MSN. I got a me.com. Um, okay. Don't say it. Don't say MSN. it. We're, what's that? Use MSN. Okay. Let me see if I have your MSN. Don't say it out loud because you're live right now. You, you can mute yourself too. Oh, yeah. I should do that. Me huh? too. <laughs> I should mute myself. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's watching other than um, George trying to get on, but disrupting you. It's all good. Thanks, Emma. That was a good call. Yeah, that way you can. Uh, actually talk about it without you know sharing personal information on the internet i i'm clearly not a youtuber i am not either (laughs) okay looks like george oh jacob's here hey jacob oh hello just noticed you guys were streaming yeah Yeah, it's not actually going to be greek bible study no um but Rick rick had some uh had a medical thing come up and he's uh so he's not able to join us so hopefully on the 26th, he'll be okay. He's recovering from a surgery. So well, oh, Emma knows man. Greek better than anyone. Yeah. You, you, I, you know. No, I literally don't. I literally failed my Greek exam. You did? Why did you fail the Greek exam? Because I didn't know Greek as well as I thought I did. <laughs> but you know Latin. I do know Latin. I passed that one. Latin's the mo- most important biblical language. That feels like a test. <laughs> <laughs> I I personally don't think it is. <laughs> I don't think it's the most important. I don't think it's negligible, but I don't uh, think it's the most important. I don't think it falls into the top three. What's the third? Aramaic. Okay, fair. <laughs> How's your Hebrew and Aramaic? Hebrew 
is pretty iffy. I need to get back into it, but I might wait till I pass the Greek exam first. Mm. Um, I have never looked at Aramaic. If you I've know Hebrew, like most people don't. Um, I mean, my Aramaic is pretty bad, despite the fact it's my father's uh, native language. Um, my family, portions of my family still speak Aramaic. But um, Aramaic is kind of sort of almost mutually intelligible with Hebrew. It's, it's a Semitic language like Arabic. And um, Semitic languages are very, very similar. And so, yeah. Interesting. Are you guys ranking in terms of difficulty? We were ranking in terms of importance, importance? but, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> Emma knows Latin. Uh -huh. and I do. As and far Greek, as but it, not super well yet. I just need to read a whole one? bunch of Greek. What, what? No, it's it's my my PhD qualifying exam. Oh, you failed your PhD qualifying exam in Greek. That is completely different from failing a class in Greek. Oh yeah, I didn't mean to give that impression, but yeah, it's That's my PhD I, qualifying uh, exam. I passed the Latin qualifying exam last year, but I failed the Greek one this spring. Well, qualifying exams, well, they used to be difficult. <laughs> I think it was pretty difficult. They give you six passages of Greek and tell you to translate it to English in four hours. It depends where you go. Yeah. We still have like pretty traditional exam types. I mean, the, so. it's, it's at the better schools where it, like you can't, you basically don't fa fail qualifying exams anymore. Yeah, because once you get into Yale, you don't need to do anything else. Yeah. Although I did, I, I, I did have somebody I knew. Um, in Not to pick on Yale in particular. In, in the physics department at USC who ended up getting a master's degree. So a master's degree is what you get when you fail out of a big PhD. <laughs> For Why some are people. You laughing. That is what happens. If you not fail, always. We have people who come here and planning to just get a master's. Right, but it's a it's the consol a consolation prize for if it if is you, also the consolation prize for not sticking through a whole PhD. Yeah. 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 But if you fail your uh, qualifying exams, you can't get a master's either. If you fail out. Wow. You need to pass at least one translation exam to get a master's. Tim is really fascinated by all these <laughs> academic discussions. He he Girl. loves academia. <laughs> next we should next we should talk about uh, the CRC Synod. Oh yeah. <laughs> so you've been watching that, Jacob? I haven't been. Well, I haven't actually watched the Senate, but I have been watching what's going on. You it's, should. You should have been there. Uh, I wish we were live streaming our um, our uh, clergy lady retreat that I was on. Um, well, why didn't you? Well, I guess I could have stood in the back and live streamed it to the internet. That would have been. <laughs> you could have at least recorded it. Yeah, somebody was recording it. That's true. So you should put it on your channel. Yeah. Tim officially runs his archdiocese channel. Not really, but <laughs> in, in a manner of speaking, some people would probably be surprised if you said that. The, this hmm. channel, this channel has been officially blessed by his uh, priests. Kind of. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Well, I, I kind of sort of prodded him into it. I was like, it's a good idea. Yeah. I was pretty nervous about the idea because I was like, well, this is for me and my buddies. And then your, Jacob's like, well, no, you need to think a little bit bigger than that. So, First of all, you do need to think bigger than that. But it was after okay. Father Stephen showed up for a six hour session. <laughs> oh my like, gosh, I saw that. That's what made me decide that, like, never mind, I'm not doing Greek Bible study. <laughs> Why? Because Father Stephen showed up? No, because it went on for six hours and I'm bad <laughs> at leaving things. So if it kept, like, if I'd been there, I would have just stayed. <laughs> well, 
I mean, you could you can leave at any time. There's nothing that says I, that yes. I leave at any but time. Technically, one can leave at any time. I have proven to myself multiple times on these that I cannot. So I, <laughs> I, I actually I watched your discussion with Paul today, oh. and um, it made me really really excited about the discussion we're having with your husband on my channel. I'm glad. He's really excited, too. Really? You already talked to him about it? Well, yeah, I knew he'd be on board. Next, I'm going to have to have Tim, Tim's wife join us. Yeah. Uh, yes, I am reading the chats, but you're not saying anything important, killer. Yeah, X, I'm not going <laughs> to engage you, killer. <laughs> killer XX River 444. You sound like my kind of my kind of guy, killer. <laughs> I mean, why are you live streaming a Bible study? Like, why would you do that? <laughs> well, Sherry's watching our uh, Bible study, and that's important. Ooh, we get to see Tim's wife. <laughs> okay. All right, see ya. What? He said, yeah, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> She didn't hear me? Uh, are you wearing headphones? She... Uh, I had I had it muted for a moment. I think she missed it. So. Yeah, she's uh, going for a walk. I, I, I said I said uh, we get we get to see Tim's wife. Mm -hmm. She's been on the internet already. So net for, net, when you ask her if she says no, say too late. You could ask her. I, could ask I know her you. One of you She'll you be saw like, my Why? mom and my sister before you all met my husband. This is true. <laughs> I, I started a series where I was doing interviews with people as couples, and it was it was actually an interesting discussion. Um, so I did Catherine and Eamon Wilson, and I did um, Michael Sartori and his wife Mandy, and Chris and his, Chris Pacal and his wife, whose name I'm forgetting, Sarah maybe, I, I forget. But anyway, um, I think I I think the fact that we don't engage couples as couples on the internet is actually part of what makes the internet so stupid. Interesting. So you're in favor of those those Facebook joint accounts? Those people who only have joint Facebook accounts? I, not only am I in favor of that, I have to wonder if there isn't some sort of nefarious purpose behind not having, like, why doesn't Facebook actually have a sort of, like, capacity for people to have joint accounts that are, that's easily, like. That's true. If it was possible in a non-dumb way, I might actually do it. I mean, the reason we both had Facebook accounts before we got married so and then once you get like, married you should like be able to like fuse, be able to merge them fuse the account from either or friends of both it would be the cutest thing in the world if you don't hate families and that's why i think it's an, it's a nefarious plot by the anti uh we won't call them jesuits uh but <laughs> Did you see Father Eric's comment on my uh, my randos? I did not. What did he say? He said, when we are Pope, Emma will be consulted on the English translation of all our papal, papal bulls and decrees. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, Fa Father Eric makes these jokes because he's completely convinced there is no chance whatsoever of him ever Which becoming Pope. Which, Which I completely funny. disagree with. I, I also disagree with that. I, I think, look, I think when the bishop makes you master of, master of ceremonies and sends you off to canon law school, it it should tell you he thinks you're you're going to move up in places. I think that's very possible. And Flebus, your wife has no patience for this because um, it's not... It's because this space is too much of a masculine space, and I'm actually hoping that engaging with people in um, engaging with people as couples will actually help increase the feminine 
uh, involvement in it. That would be nice. Uh, I mean, as we discussed. Um, yeah. What? Oh, as we discussed last night, I'm kind of broken and my husband and I are backwards. So You and your husband. Well, have you met Andrea with the bangs? I have. Yeah. Well, no, I haven't met her. I've seen, I saw her Rando's conversation. You, you should, you should, you, you should check out her channel. I should. I've been meaning to. And there used to be on the Discord, the women used to have a literal knitting circle with Sherry. And man, I was knitting all last night. So, you know what? I, so I'm not on BLM anymore, but if you want to have a knitting circle on my Discord, you are more than welcome to have a knitting circle. I will dedicate a room just for women knitting and I will sex re uh, restrict it as things should be. <laughs> <laughs> when we have the Jerusalem Council, I, I, was, I was like thinking about how, George. I'm in. Hello. Hi. Hey, George. You made it. Yeah. Sorry. That was, sorry about that, George. That was a fiasco. Uh, sorry. Right. I think I'm on StreamYard. <laughs> you Good. are on StreamYard, yes. Yes. Okay. If, if, if you're hearing an echo, you might have YouTube in the... You're not hearing an echo, are you? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, unless it's the natural echo in the room that you're in. You sound good yeah. to us. Yeah. You, oh, you sound good to us, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, what was I saying about the... Oh, so when we have the Jerusalem conference, I think one of the most um so i've been trying to think like what would what would i have to explain to people who aren't used to an orthodox jewish environment and the right. number one thing is going to be the sex segregation mm -hmm. yeah um like a lot of people just aren't used to the type of sex segregation that exists and in, in like it's really not considered okay to extend a hand to shake hands with people of the opposite sex. Uh, mm. Certainly no hugging. Um, mm -hmm. And even sitting next to is, is kind of not done. Like, um, <laughs> I mean, it is by some people, but a by a lot of people, it's not done. And we're probably going to have at least some of those people. Nahama uh, said her, <laughs> her family would be coming and I'm guessing some of Fezzi's family would be coming. And um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much of an Orthodox Jewish uh, contingent there will be, but if there is, yeah. When I was, Please, um, yeah. When I was looking into Eastern Orthodoxy, um, a friend of ours who was a Pentecostal, mm -hmm. um, uh, I told her, oh, yeah, we're, we're going to become Orthodox. And she said, oh, so you can't shake hands with women? That was like the one thing that she knew about. Or, well, that's true of Orthodox yeah, Jews. Not the same religion. but Yes. <laughs> Wrong Orthodox, but right. good try. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, George, uh, I was listening to your discussion yesterday, and I, I'm also kind of interested in... Um, in familial DNA, but it was actually because my maternal grandmother's family is the only part of my family that's not very Jewish. Like after my grandmother uh, got married, her entire family converted to be Baha'i, which is a Islamic religion. And like, there was a time in my life where I was like, am I really Jewish? Maybe my grandmother really wasn't Jewish. I like, we don't know much about that side of the family. So I did my mtDNA testing, mitochondrial DNA, and it came back Jewish. So I was like, yes. So my maternal grandmother. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Uh, when you say it came back uh, Jewish, because usually uh, at least through family tree DNA, Mm. It, it doesn't come back and tell you anything about nationality or race. It gives you a haplogroup that you belong to. Right. So I, I, I got the haplogroup. And um, so I did it through National Geography. 
Okay. And it I, it identified my mtDNA as being um, in in Jewish uh, communities. And then when I looked it up, some ten percent apparently of Persian Jew Jews have the same mtDNA as I do. Okay. Yeah. Huh. I, I wasn't aware of that. I mean, I know that um, in my particular case, um, it's on the paternal side and it's, and you may, to, may have heard it, it's, uh, uh, I belong to one of only two haplogroups that's indigenous. Well, that's to, to Y Europe. chromosomes. Yeah. Right, so that's right, Y right. chromosomes. Right. So and, then, and then you yeah. can, like, if you were to go on uh, SNP tracker, Mm -hmm. uh, it will actually give you the path right. uh, all the way to current day, uh, but showing the path over hundreds of thousands of years from the beginning. And uh, tDNA but, data is not nearly as developed as Y chromosome data oh, okay. because they only started sequencing it so many years ago. Be, um, and because... Um, it's not autosomal DNA at all, so it doesn't tell you anything about your right. Right. Yeah. That's it does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty stable, though, isn't it? mtDNA? Well, kind of. I mean, it does. I'm pretty sure. I mean, I'm pretty sure over like it mutates over a thousand years, like which you know that's that's still pretty significant mutation when you think about it. Although mm -hmm. I have to say my beliefs in some, my scientific beliefs goes kind of askance from what a lot of people believe because I, I am a, what's sometimes I like to refer to as an old earth creationist. I, I don't, have you heard of Omphalus? I, I looked into that after you mentioned that uh, some months ago. Jacob. So Emma, what does Omphalus mean? Naval. It does. And uh, so the, since this is a Greek uh, Bible study, Omphalos, mm -hmm. so did Adam have a belly button? <laughs> Serious question. Serious there, there's, question. You know, my parents had that book, but I never read it. There's a book? There's actually Omphalos? a book called Did Adam and Eve Have Belly Buttons? Oh. Um, I mean, it's, um. it's, a, it's a serious theological question. Because yeah, it is. if if they did, then that means that there was something deceptive in how God created them. Mm -hmm. Because they never had umbilical cords. I think and, that's where go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. And luckily enough for me, the Talmud is very, very clear about this. Um, we learn from where it says um uh, God created trees with fruit, that the trees were created bearing fruit, meaning they were fully grown. And there's several verses in, in the Bible where the, uh, where the Talmud learns out that actually the, the world was created fully grown. And so in Orthodox Judaism, a version of Omphalos is completely considered standard belief and has been for over a thousand years that that question makes a lot more sense than if somebody's like uh, you know do you believe in adam and eve it's like or it's like obviously i, I can't think of any <laughs> any story about the origins of humanity that doesn't involve the first two people it's just where do you draw that line you know <laughs> well i mean i mean if the, we're, the, we're taking the, so this is one of the difficult parts for a lot of modern Orthodox, and we've been talking on my Discord about modern Orthodox Judaism. Um, modern Orthodoxy is a flavor that, so Orthodox Judaism is split into two big fa factions, modern Orthodox and what people derogatorily refer to as ultra-Orthodox. And uh, a lot of modern Orthodox don't like the ultra-Orthodox view of creation uh, because they find it unscientific. And part of that is like, okay, there were Neander Neanderthals, right? So like at what level and 
like how how do you get everybody descended from the same two people if you had two separate species but yeah the the definition of species is kind of a slippery thing according to ted as of yesterday but like the, it's i mean it's just obvious that you, it, it it just to me it seems uh just completely um it's impossible to argue otherwise that there was at some point just two people there i can't i can't think of any mathematical or whatever rational way that you can <laughs> that, the otherwise, I mean, unless you say, oh, there was two people from one group and then they combined with people from another group. And then when they came together, it became humanity. Like, okay. Well, I mean, oh. part of it is as an all, and I want to let you speak, George, if you want to speak. <laughs> um, in, George, yeah. and I, if, if you, if you don't interrupt me, George, I'll, I'll speak forever. I've been known to speak forever. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, uh, uh, welcome to the to the group. Because <laughs> uh, I can be that way too. No, I mean, I'm I'm just sitting here going, as a cradle Orthodox Christian. This is not what's important. It, Thank it's you. The, it's the relationship between man and God. And. When you get down to the scientific stuff, mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's just our nature. We, you know, we have questions and, and they're great questions. I mean, do, do they have navels? Uh, it's not anything, but it's the relationship part that's the most important thing. Now, the wonderful thing is, is being someone that's into uh, genetics, it would be nice <laughs> if we would be able to take things like the Shroud of Turin uh, and take samples and see what that says or take, since we have so many relics and I've talked to Father Chris about this, wouldn't it be nice if we could t take one of the relics and find out what that DNA says? But Haven't people that, done DNA analysis of Eucharistic miracles? I'm sure that they have in the Catholic world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because I'm pretty again, sure they have. Well, if they have, it would be nice to see what came up. But again, I well, have to go Eucharist. Back and... I, I I would be very surprised if Catholics allowed the Eucharist to have any. No, the miracles. Okay. The ones where it becomes. Um, oh, where it becomes blood. Where it like becomes flesh, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, it's it's just a whole different. For me, I'm just. Um, okay, so on that question about um, <laughs> Phlebas is being finding his humanity in, uh, in the Eucharist. we already have a Jacob on Phlebas. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, George. No, I, I was just going to say, you know, a lot of people say, well, yeah, but isn't it still uh, uh, wine and bread? I mean, what's this whole thing that it turns into Christ? Here. This is the, and, huh? and th this is this discussion is like one of the. Uh, you can uh, share your screen, Emma. You should be able to share your screen. Okay. Oh, oh, but if I yeah. Finish, if, if I could finish the thought, yeah, sorry, finish ahead, it. is that wouldn't that be the same thing of looking at Christ? What would you see of Christ? Flesh and blood right as a human being you don't see anything else but he was fully man and fully god why can't the eucharist be seen as fully god and fully man well fully that's god. that's the thing with the these miracles is it becomes visible like it starts bleeding or like it's I know at least one, it's turned into like heart muscle. Here, let me share. This is, and this is not something that has occurred in orthodoxy, by the way. You're right. You guys don't do. You guys don't do eucharistic miracles. No, the, yeah, there's certain things that that um, you know. It's interesting. There's there's miracles that will occur like in the Murder. Catholic Church that don't occur in the Orthodox Church, and vice versa. You know, like um, icons that bleed blood. We have icon or or statues you that see bleed that? blood. Yeah, I can. Let me add it. Oh, you got it. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, okay. we have icons in, that emit uh, uh, fragrant myrrh. Mm -hmm. Right. This is a right. pretty yeah. common thing. And you can smell it. Mm -hmm. It smells Orthodox like that. From what I've heard, orthodoxy and icon, because the explanation I heard is that icons were more of like a contentious thing in orthodoxy. So they have more miracles and more practices around them. Whereas in the West, the Eucharist was the thing that people had like a harder time sort of getting. Um, so they, like, that's why we have Eucharistic adoration. And that's also why we have had miracles because they're often to like shore up people's faith. That's interesting. That's why yeah. God would give them. Hmm. Nope. So this is three different um, examples of the Eucharistic miracle in Lanciano, Italy. I've seen this before, yeah. Um, and the article talks about how um, there's been extensive scientific analysis on three different ones. Yeah, but it's by a Jesuit. How can you believe a Jesuit? It, it's not by a Jesuit. It's by a woman. No, no, no. You, you were where you were saying a little bit below. Oh, the, uh, this particular quote. Yeah, there was a quote by a Jesuit. And um, there are people who watch my channel who believe that um, the Jesuits are, are controlling the world. Yeah, yeah okay. I mean, Grim Grizz says if he becomes Catholic, he's going to become a Jesuit so he can prove or disprove all his theories. Well, <laughs> you know, we had the first Jesuit Pope. Yep. Mm -hmm. Seems like a, a long time for it to take if they are controlling it. Yeah, I was kind of surprised he's the first Jesuit pope too. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. Um, I guess this particular one the actually were happened Jesuits. under him. This was literally <laughs> just the first article I found when I Googled it. But, hmm. um, it talks about they at least have found like human DNA. Um, I guess they weren't able to find enough DNA to do full, full when I visited, analysis. When I visited Father Eric in um, North Dakota, um, he showed me the relics and there was a relic of the true cross in, in his church. Mm -hmm. Nice. I can't, I'll drop the link to this article in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what what so George what did, what did Father Chris say about you you about your uh, your you know curiosity about scientific analysis of well he he relics? may he may have been um, cordial in his response in support of the work that I'm doing outside um, you know mm -hmm. he you know he's 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 very much that way. Mm -hmm. um, how serious he was about it, um, I, I can't speak for for him, but um, I think he thought there was um, because genetic analysis is a relatively 21st century um, phenomena for us. I mean, it didn't exist until I mean, it did. We knew about it, but it, where it's at today, it's uh, we're only scratching the surface. Uh, but to answer your question, um, I, 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 I guess what's going on in my head is that uh, being where I'm at, for anybody that knows, I'm 71 years old. I'm a cradle Orthodox, born in this country, though, um, a minority faith in this country. So I grew up around Catholics and Protestants. And by the time I got into uh, being an adult, um, I would have conversations with former Catholics or Protestants or Catholics and former Protestants. I visited all as many churches as I, as I can. I just threw up my hands. I said, it's all so divided in the West uh, in terms of, you know, for example, one person that was a former Catholic said, uh, well, I don't practice anymore because they made me feel guilty, guilty. And I, that was one response I went guilty. There's nothing in the Orthodox faith has ever 
had it to where I felt guilty. Um, with the Protestants, the problem there was a Baptist isn't a Baptist. Baptists are all over the place. I could talk to one Baptist, and this is what they believe, and I talk to another Baptist, and this is what they believe. So uh, this is Father so I, Chris, your brother, Tim? No, that's Father Christian. Oh. Father Christopher is the priest at St. Anna Greek Orthodox yeah, Church. Yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. So, um, yeah, it was a casual conversation. I don't think it was, um, we didn't go any further. Um, and, uh, but, but I might follow up with him uh, just on the side and say, so how serious were you on that? I mean, do you really think? But, but my point is, is there's something about faith alone. And the fact that if we were to approach our faith by having to have proof, um, I think we're missing the, the whole idea of what faith means. Of course, I'm not one that says faith alone, because faith without works is dead. As Luther found out reading James that, oh, what do I do with this book? Because this does not teach what I'm teaching. Yeah. Throw in the uh, right. <laughs> but, still, but, but still, the bottom line is it starts with faith. And out of true faith comes the works. And what is the works? It's, it's being Christ-like uh, in all that we do. That we're, it's not about me, it's about what I do for, for my fellow man and woman. Um, so it, it, the conversations are always interesting to me outside of orthodoxy, uh, but I'm just kind of sharing a little bit of a piece that um, cause, cause I, di I didn't take my faith for, you know, well, we're orthodoxy and we're right. Like I said, in my early twenties, I mean, I went to Esther, I went to motivational speakers. I went to all of these different things to find Rolling out. Stones. Huh? You went to Altamont? I did. I was at Altamont. I want you to tell the Altamont. What's story. Altamont? I didn't know you knew that I went to Altamont. You, you told me about it. Yeah. What is Altamont? <laughs> uh, well, let me just say that I have a son-in-law that gets re gets really excited. When Look up Rolling Stones Altamont, 1969. Yeah. December, December, I don't know, 17th or something around there. The Hells Angels were the were the uh, security. Right. It's, <laughs> and there was a murder there. Yeah. Um, and did you? Were you the one who did the murder? No, no, but I was up close. I hitchhiked down from uh, from Sacramento with a friend of mine that was from Orange County, and I was 17 years old. And when we got there, uh, and there was like three different changes in vehicles, uh, but the last vehicle was we had been dropped off in Berkeley, and from Berkeley right to where um, outside of the Altamont speedway uh and everybody's playing you know a bunch of guitars playing fires and people are partying and my my friend goes uh almost immediately let's try to get in and i remember going yeah right ron we're gonna we're all these people we're gonna be able to get in by the way by the time it started there ended up being three hundred thousand plus equal to uh woodstock um but we and got this is, in and there this was is this is the December just following Woodstock. So Woodstock was just Woodstock you know, was summer, yeah, six months earlier, yeah, uh, and peace and love and all that. And right. there's and a this, theological yeah. thing here that happened to, for me, uh, and uh, Don McLean actually put it into his song, and I'm going. Everybody I ever told about my experience laughed at me, and I'll tell you what that is, but. When he came out with that song and that verse, the fourth verse, I think, or whatever. Of which exactly, song? Uh, uh, American Pie. American Pie, okay. Um, so anyways, so there's probably only 50 people when we got in there, and they're still building the stage of what was to be, like I said, 300,000 people. So um, the show starts. Um, um, it was jam-packed uh there was lots of acts throughout the day um uh, crosby stills nash and young jefferson airplane they were the big big names of the bay area kind of, or california and when the rolling stones came on 
And this is when the murder happened. And I tell people, it's not that I believe that the Rolling Stones are w Satan worshipers, but on that night, Satan was there. And when he started singing Sympathy for the Devil, he was the devil. He was the vehicle of it. And I got, and the murder happened during that time. And I, at that, at that moment, um, because I remember we were all sitting on our sleeping bags. When the murder happened, everybody that was behind it got pushed back. So I lost my sleeping bag and all of that. But I said, I, I got to go. So I left and what have you. I won't tell you the rest of the story, but it, it's, it's those experiences that I've had. And I, I'm happy that, that in my, in, from my standpoint, that true faith, in my opinion, comes from being able to discern what's around you. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't line up, I naturally get paranoid. I'll go into a party or whatever. If I don't feel comfortable, I'm gone, um, especially if it's contrary to uh, my faith. But I don't know if that's what you wanted me to to, to mention, but uh, the devil was there. The whole experience, when I look back on it, especially with the Rolling Stones, and the, I mean, uh, with the uh, Hells Angels. And the, the murder happened during what song? Uh, sympathy for the devil. Sympathy for the devil. Yeah, yeah that's you, you that's guys are familiar with that. Wikipedia says. Yeah, I know yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and fame. Uh, been around for a long, long time. Stole many a man's soul away. Uh, pleased to meet you. Hope you guess my name. So it keeps on going through the verses, and when he says, I "Hope you guess my name," is Satan. Um, now, okay, but say, reading this, the guy who got killed pulled out a gun and got stabbed by the Hell's Jets Angels. I right, mean, like, he, pulled, right, he pulled right. out a gun. Right, right, right. There, I there, have there, a lot less sympathy. <laughs> yeah, but if you saw what the Rolling Stone, I mean, what the Hell's Angels were doing, they were beating people over the head with cue sticks. They pushed, they. It was almost disgusting to well, see that apparently they, made, they got they, paid in beer. <laughs> well, right, right. <laughs> to, to the security. And so they were very drunk. I mean, I'm reading about this. This is well, like, mm -hmm. yeah. The, this nope. sounds like a Protestant uh, conference. And yeah. that's, the, that's the type of thing that happened. What? <laughs> you have is this hierarchy. Is yeah. this happening at the CRC right now? Well, that, the thing is, like, the guy, there's a guy complaining about the $500 for the beer that ne he never got paid. He still hasn't gotten paid back for. And that just reminded me of the $500 I shelled out for the campgrounds that I still haven't gotten paid back for. So, um, <laughs> the, this... Uh, the Oriental great. Orthodox are here. Oh, yeah, Andrew's here. Hello. How's it been? Hello. Power. Uh, did you know, did uh, his great series on uh, uh, how we got here, and it a burn. Uh, I'll send you a link, George. Um, burn Power is an, another YouTuber I've been following. Okay, okay. Um, and I'm not calling Andrew Oriental Orthodox because he's Asian. He's actually a cop. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> he's um, non Chalcedonian, no. so he's he's oh, even more of a heretic than I am. <laughs> So um, you agree with Chalcedon? No way. I don't agree with any of it, but at yeah. least I have a covenant with God. Like you're like just a heretic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, Burn said um, that he, what, 1969, the summer of 1969, there's Woodstock and there's all this right. mystique about it. And Burns, Burn was saying like basically the that summer of love, the the whole of the 60s mystique is based yeah. on this one event right. and by the end of the event it's over right and altamont is just putting the nail in the coffin the coffin there's music no after that that's where american pie the, it's one segment 
he calls it the generation lost in space. Uh, and, and being one of them, I would say yes, because that changed my whole view of the peace and love thing. They were just words. They were selfish words. Yeah, you want peace so you can do what you want to do. And the love was love the one you're with. Doesn't okay. matter who you're, you're with. Church, I, I, I asked so, a question. I but, asked but a question. Can, let me just finish my, my uh, one thought. Thank you, Jacob. Is that if you look at the history starting with 1970, look at what happened. Jimi Hendrix died. Janis Joplin died. The Beatles broke up. Everything changed, to your point, Tim, um, because it, it was over. The, the, the truth had been revealed that it wasn't the truth. Um, and, and people became more introspective. The musicians became more introspective. You had Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. You had Jackson Brown, um, what have you. So you had Cat Stevens um, that were looking at the meaning of life rather than it's all about you know, that's what I was going to ask you about. Okay. So yesterday I asked the question, you, you said you have a Cat Stevens uh, tribute band. Yeah. So are you going to have to co uh, convert to Islam just to be no. authentic? No, no. <laughs> that's why it's called a Cat Stevens. <laughs> right. Yeah, Not Yusuf Islam? No, no, I don't do Yusuf Islam. <laughs> uh, and I don't do anything of that. I used to be, and I hope you're not the same as you were when you were uh, 20. Some of us go down uh, the wrong path as we get older. Some uh, correct the path. And that's why I believe uh, God has given us this limited amount of time. Yeah, I was a much but better a person when I was 20. <laughs> you were? <laughs> <laughs> I, when I was in my 20s, I actually kept kosher did my prayers three times a day, kept the Sabbath. Yeah, I've, I've, I've gone downhill, definitely. Well, <laughs> I doubt that. In some ways, I've gone downhill. In other ways, maybe no. We'll see. We'll see. Let's hope. I, I do think that I think God gives us extra. God gives us every single year as an opportunity to be better than the year before. Right. Or every single day. If, if that's a good point. I don't know if it was Father Cosmas that said it, um, who was the priest at St. Anna's before Father Chris. If 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 you're the same this year as you were last year, you're not growing. Mm -hmm. You're not growing. You, and you, you and you're you wasting you, God's time. Well, you're wasting your time. <laughs> you're wasting yeah, your but well, yeah. The reason I the reason I put it that way is because I think it's important to remember that it's the time God gives you. Whatever that is. Yeah. But if you're an infant, um, you know, obviously there wasn't much time there. Um, but um, I believe he takes you immediately uh, because you didn't have the chance uh, and because of human intervention in many cases. Uh, it wasn't their choice. Well, that's actually an interesting thing. I was not aware that Christians had this idea that, um, so I, I, I know there are various uh, theologies in Christianity about it, but like there were certainly a lot of Christians who thought that if <laughs> an infant died unbaptized, they, they would not be saved. And that was very surprising to me because in Judaism, we definitely have this idea of like being old enough to sin. And if you're not old enough to sin, then there's no sin there. Jacob, what? I was, I was rewatching your um, talk with Father Stephen Young and you were Which talking the uh, first one. Okay. And you were talking about how to live is to be sinful. How this idea of Christ as this unsinful man, right? The righteous person falls seven times. Okay, yes. So there there are various categories of sins. So there's sin as in chet, which means to miss the mark. And it is impossible as a human being not to miss the mark. So uh, we believe that it is impossible 
for people for human beings not to miss the mark but that's not that's 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 not like the type of sin you end up in hell for you know that's an interesting comment i i was reminded of a story about a monk who um and when you talk about missing the mark which is a heck of a lot better translation correct translation of what sin means versus uh, you're a terrible horrible person no <laughs> you're created in the image and likeness of god that's what an orthodox would say but by our free will we can miss the mark and what's the missing of the mark is the growth that you would get getting closer and closer um, um, to to uh, to god but Going back to the story of this monk, he was, um, he had a drinking problem. And all of the other monks in the, um, uh, at the particular uh, monastery uh, didn't like him. They just, he disgusted them. And one day um, he, um, uh, he passed away and they were actually elated as the story goes, and actually went to the abbot, or what do we call them, Tim? <laughs> the, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and um, uh, kind of wanted to get the what the thoughts were from uh, the abbot, uh, thinking that he would be happy too because he wasn't a very good representative of uh, of the monastery. Uh, but the abbot corrected them, says, "You don't understand." when i'll just make up a name um um well, seraphim, Chris. Where, yeah when seraphim <laughs> when seraphim was a young boy the turks took him and abused him sexually and to kill the pain they gave him rakit which is a greek liqueur and so this boy grew up being fed Raki while they did whatever that is that they did to him. By the time he got to the monastery, over time, those two bottles of Raki ended getting down to two shots of Raki. He was growing. It's like the St. John's uh, ladder uh, that you're 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 to miss the mark you can you can you can make progress but still not be completely rid of missing the mark mm -hmm. but you are making an effort through your faith to get to where god wants us to be um and and that that to me says a lot in alignment with missing the mark and for anyone that still struggles, I'll be the first one to admit there are still things that I still struggle with that I can lay aside for a long, long time. And all of a sudden, um, the devil made me do it kind of a thing. I'll just say my own free will gave in to the temptation. Um, and, um, well, I'm still here. And Lord, have mercy on me a sinner may you remember me as like the thief on the cross that it's not necessary what is the the first hour versus the 11th hour um i still got some time and thank god and then whatever whatever's to be will be but i have faith that uh he knows my heart um and his love for me and my love for him um well i i guess i can't say for sure well, I mean, I, I think that's true of the vast majority of people, but there are people who are actually bad people, right? There are people who are actually bad people. And one of the things that I have, I have, um, I have several times had to um, point out to people is, especially in this little corner, especially people who come from a Protestant background is not to mistake yourself for the genuinely bad people 
like there um there are you you have to you have to have a sort of i don't want to call it pride but you have to have a sense of tranquility over the fact that there are sins you could be committing you could be a much better worse person than you actually are and um, you should you should in fact have a, a sense of peace over that. Right, and, and that's, a, that's a that's a good point. But don't forget about Calvinism. I don't know, Jacob. Because <laughs> oh, I, I, I almost guess, call it humility. Because Verveke talks about this sense of in betweenness, right? Like. Well, in Christianity, it's like we split up the coming of the Messiah between first and second, right? Uh, in some sense, Luther's kind of right when he says, in some sense, we're saints and we're also sinners, right? Yeah, um, but then then what Luther did was revel in his sin. Yeah, 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 which is not good. Um, but when you talk about like being glad you're not a... a whatever murderer and fornicator and yada 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 like so okay number one yes thing, yes num but, number one but, thing i say to people to people who tell me they stop are the getting worst rid of the in-betweenness jacob come on no 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 no, 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 no. it's it i'm not getting rid of the in-betweenness i'm getting rid of this idea that in between means extremes of both yeah that's true uh, uh, okay so here's here's how orthodox approach it orthodox christians we have a, a simple prayer, and I have used this prayer when I'm under attack. And when I say under attack, I mean under attack. And I'll, at some point in time, I'll share uh, the term logizmi uh, and what that means from an orthodox perspective. But um, where was I going to go with this? Um, um, and to, oh. Uh, we no, say what's done. called okay. the, the Jesus prayer, and this is how it goes. But the right way to say it is because when we begin coming into Lent, Paschal Lent, in order for it to work for us is, is has to do with our humility. And you can't have humility unless you look at yourself this way, and I'll say the Jesus player first in its simple form, and it's just said over and over and over again. You're not having to be elaborate. You can, you can say some other things, but Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. But to make it more specific, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. But to make it even more exact, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, the sinner. I'm not judging anybody else because we're told not to judge others. Before you complain about the or compare yourself against somebody else, well, I do all of these things, but I'm not like that person, right? As the, as the uh, publican said, right? Um, I'm sorry, the, the uh, Pharisee, um, that it's when you look at yourself as worse than anybody else uh, will you get that humility. Otherwise, and I know a lot of Christians, and I know I'm just as guilty, we spend too much time judging other people. We're asked to love everyone where they're at. Where they're at. Even if they're the worst, Christ teaching is for us to love, at least from the Orthodox Christian standpoint, we're to love people where they're at. Do we want them to stay where they're at? Um, no, but but we can, what, what would Christ have done, right? So I don't know if that made any, any sense to you, but when we're talking about, I'm not bad like these other people. Um, we're, we're looking at our own salvation. And so it has been very, very helpful for me to rather than go, well, I'm sure glad I'm not like those people, uh, that I just look at my own self and say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, the sinner. And then again, 
when we say a prayer before we take communion, it ends, remember me like the thief on the cross. So, and the thief on the cross, look at his whole life, what he did. And it's hard for people to think that, oh, I was, I mean, there's tons of stories in the New Testament, right? The uh, prodigal mm-hmm. son. I did all of these things and you take this one over here and whatever. It, you, can, you can get the same thing at the 11th hour as the person who from the very beginning was had a halo around his head or her head. I don't know. You're smiling there, Jacob. What, what are your? What I are your am thoughts? because I'm. I'm not going to run Jacob's greatest hits on you. Um, <laughs> it's uh, Cl- uh, clown of Babylon that says, "I'm sure glad I'm not like those Pharisees." <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, I like that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, but the, but the, the reality is, uh, there was a, actually a sermon done on it is that it doesn't mean that the the pharisee was doing the wrong things he went to he went to the synagogue he went he he did all the things that were asked to do his one fault was in judging someone else so in, jesus jesus says something that so one of the one of the interesting things for me learning more about Christianity has been um, there when I discuss things with Christians, oftentimes I know that they're not in the Bible. And so I would not bring them up because I would think, oh, these are rabbinic things. And so Christians wouldn't agree with them. And one thing, um, as I've learned more about the, the Gospels, is the actually the Christian Bible has a record of a lot of Jewish things that goes a lot old, that's a lot older than the Jewish physical records of them. Uh, So for example, the Talmud quotes almost incessantly by the Kol Midotav Shal HaKadosh Baruch Hu Midah Keneged Midah, which means um, all of the measures of uh, God are uh, measure for measure. By the, by, by the measure that you judge, so shall you be judged. And when you judge other people, you bring judgments upon yourself. Now, I, I mean, so Elijah is uh, what's called a Noahide, um, which is a Gentile who believes in Orthodox Judaism. I know, weird thing, they just popped out of nowhere. Um, and so he he's... He's, he's prodding with, with uh, a deep knowledge of Judaism when he says, how can sin be known as sin without judgment against it? Um, and I think there that's where I was kind of smiling because um, I, I do think that we are, we are bound to sin. Uh, we are bound to judge sin. And like Deuteronomy, I believe it's 2929 says, um, that those things which are hidden belong to God and those things uh, which are revealed are ours and our uh, children's to um, uphold them. Uh, so I, I think at some extent it is necessary to in fact judge because... Um, I, I we, would call that discern. Well, um, I mean, if if there is a practical... Sometimes you have to defend the weak against the wicked. And so that is, I, I think, a, a real act of discernment, you could call it. But um, at, in even doing something like that, I think you have to recognize, okay, I am, in fact, standing up against people that I think are wicked. Um, I think all of us kind of agree that uh, it's pretty crazy what is going on with the um, medical transitioning of minors, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll put it lightly. Uh, the, and so, you know, at some, at some degree, you can, you can be like, you know, 
what do I know and, and who am I to judge? But at some point you have to say, uh, there are there are children who appear to genuinely be uh, hurt and therefore it is it is my place and I do have to make this judgment and recognize that that judgment will flow upon me as well in the fact that I do and that I am judging. Yeah, well, I, 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 I hear you. I'm, I'm watching Trey. I want to hear what, is it Trey? It is Trey. Yeah. I, I like to yeah. hear, but, 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 but to me, what you're talking about um, is a different kind of judgment. And that's why I say discern that certainly you, you, we, we are given the ability to know that this is not of God. This is not of what he wants. Um, so I don't have a problem with that. But when we go into the New Testament, there's two commandments. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbor. Those are the two. And if you do those things, you Je will. Jesus cribbed that completely off our Bible. Like that's completely plagiarizing I don't know why he didn't cite his sources. Oh, yeah. He did. I'm joking. I'm joking. No, it, it's just very, it, it, sometimes it's kind of funny to me to hear Christians say, well, Jesus said, as if these, the, this isn't what Judaism taught before Jesus. Well, okay, technically, so go ahead. one and the same. Okay. Jesus and God are the same. So it's sort of like the same source. You know what I mean? Right. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So that's a different perspective. But, 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 you know, the, the one thing about Protestants, especially, um, is um, they go on scripture alone, right? And of course, my response as an Orthodox Christian is what translation? Because <clears throat> translations end up being. Uh, well, even which books? Because well, their Bible, well, right, yeah, right. It's a sad, it's a sad case for Judaism because I used to date a when I was much younger a Jewish uh, gal, and uh, that's a funny story because everybody was wondering, so how is this going to work? The the Greek Orthodox and and they were liberal or the more uh, they weren't strict uh, Orthodox Jews. Uh, but they have yeah, you wouldn't be dating her if they yeah. They yeah. Were. Uh, so so you know it it. But it's very the, funny. The West, today. the West, the West is so. To me, Protestants and Catholics are two sides of the same coin. <laughs> Funny. We feel that way about Orthodox. Emma, Orthodox Emma has, has a whole. It's a whole. Emma is Catholic. Way. Emma is Catholic. You're Eastern Orthodox. Right. Trey is a various Protestant, and Andrew is a semi-Muslim. <laughs> Get out of here! I like that. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> I like that. So, so, but. But how Are you thinking about my uh, randos combo, Jacob? Yes, I, I loved it. I completely agree with you. I think I think a lot of people who convert to Eastern Orthodoxy in the United States uh, from Protestants, they they actually do it for Protestant reasons. Yeah. I think Protestant I think, reasons. Yeah, I think they're very Protestant in their embrace of Eastern Orthodoxy. I had a son-in-law whose father, whose grandfather was a pastor. Protestant pastor whose father was a Protestant pastor and John my son-in-law um, who's married to my stepdaughter um, went to a Baptist seminary and came out as a ordained pastor in the Protestant faith mm -hmm. uh, but over time uh, he began to learn about orthodoxy even though he, I mean he was a Calvinist that's how Different. God have mercy on the soul. R different. Uh, but he is now Orthodox. There's nothing. It took him a lot of time to get to where he needed to be, to to be where he's at. I don't I don't see anything that he's carrying over that is um, uh, Protestant. 
because decentralized I, ecclesiology. Hold, hold up, I got even a hotter that, take. What, say, I think, I think Orthodox is more Buddhist than Protestant. <laughs> what? Huh. Explain. Why that. Here, I'll say it. I think That's that spicy. I, I well, think that, that if you're looking. Point. I think if you're looking for the more mystical experience, right, either your choices are you go to Buddhism or you go to Orthodoxy, mm. right? In some sense, if you want the sort of mystical experiences, that's that's Good. what I see from a lot of people. Um, I, I think oh, the Catholic mystical head. tradition gets overlooked, especially in this little corner. But. It does, but also the charismatic tradition. Mm -hmm. True. They're a little crazy, though. So this killed me. What's this? So <laughs> there was somebody who was um, stealing Bibles from the Arizona um, from the Arizona uh, legislature um, room for uh, members of the legislature. Like she and they put in a camera and they found out who it was, and she was putting them under seat cushions like that's that's almost desecration she's an ordained presbyterian minister went to princeton seminary and she's a youth minister at her church and people are talking about about the the legislature um the legislature disciplining her and i'm like why has she not been defrocked yeah do they call it that i think so well that's because of what their beliefs are i don't think Honestly, they have beliefs. they're spineless like, man they're protestant you know, what, you know what i was going to say to to is that they're woman ordained un protestant. unfortunately from the protestant standpoint it's only scripture. They ignore the history of the church. It's like kind of like it existed in the first century and then it went into apostasy and it came out in the 16th century and everyone else in between was off. Uh, even though it says neither the, ga uh, the gates of hell would prevail yeah, against the church. But, I, but if you read second century, third century, fourth century, fifth century writings, and I'll start with second century Irenaeus on uh, heresy. We've taken heresy as a damning thing. It's actually, number one, when he writes, he says, don't go, don't break off, stay in the, the faith. And we're, it's not about one person, but unfortunately that's how we are. I don't agree with you, so I'm gonna start another church. And that's why I said, that's where Protestant is in concept. I don't like the drummer. I'm going to go join another church so I can get, you know, from a Catholicism standpoint, there was a split that was made um, uh, early on. Um, and, you know, Protestantism came out of orthodoxy. Protestantism tried to connect with the Orthodox Church because now the Orthodox Church is under the Ottoman Turks. So, but I don't know if you guys have ever read the discourse or the letters that were written between emissaries from the Lutherans to the patriarch Jeremiah in Constantinople, trying to see, hey, we know about you. We believe that you're the church, uh, but uh, here's what we're doing. Here's what we had against the Roman Catholics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you guys haven't heard of it, I'll get the title. I have the book here. We've heard of it. I mean, people have, have we, uh, Jordan Cooper and uh, certain people have certainly mentioned it, mm -hmm. but part of the reason I don't think they've actually quoted. So I have this idea that people would will quote things unless they know it, like there's nothing in it that's that's good for them. And because I keep on hearing Protestants talk about these letters and never quoting from them, it makes me assume that like the response they got from the from patriarchs of the East was not very good for their thing. Well, th what they found out from their perspective is there was there was too much from their standpoint 
that seem to be like what Catholics do. Mm-hmm. But but they're very cordial letters. They're not angry, but it was actually Patriarch Jeremiah that ended the conversation in a very loving way. Um, you know, peace be with you, but we're just sharing you with the church. And, and this is for me in the 21st century. When I read the writings that were written by disciples of the apostles and the disciples of the disciples of the apostles on down line, I know I'm in the, uh, the Orthodox church has maintained the teachings because I'm going, that's the church I belong to. What's being described by Irenaeus uh, is, uh, and others for sure, Athanasios in the fourth century, who's the one that came up with the 27 books. There were lots of books that were being written even in the first century that were not true and they were tossed aside okay so 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 the the young guys on the bottom here are having their little trolling messages in the private chat i want to see them i i I miss listen and orthodox have putin well, <laughs> just want to see Catholics have Joe Biden and Na- Nancy Pelosi. Well, we can, we can, I like that. Hey, there's sin. There is sin in all aspects. But before you say Orthodox have Putin, um, there have been more martyrs come out of the communist countries um, than uh, ever in history. This but is, unfortunately, yeah. I believe that the patriarch in Russia is, if he didn't say what he was in support of Putin, he would be dead. He would be dead. Um, and I have to say, I mean, maybe you can verify this better, but um, I'm guessing what I'm going to say is not so shocking. This is something I, I often tell um, people who are orthobros. I don't know if you've heard of orthobros. But there are people on the internet who think that they're orthodox and they, they think they're more orthodox than the orthodox and they tend to be very ignorant and people refer to them as the ortho bros. And one thing I have had to mention to them is um, I think cradle orthodox, especially those who live in places like um, other countries in the United States, I'm a child of immigrants, so yeah. I still have family in Greece. Um, they do not really look up to the patriarchs uh, and the hierarchy the same. They they, they love their priests, but like once you start get talking about bishops this and stuff, mm-hmm. um, excuse my language, but this li- but this is something I've I've heard shit floats to the top. You know, th- there's a. They, and this is why every single time. And, and yet, you want Father time. Eric to become Pope? Well, I want Father Eric to become Pope because, frankly, I think it would be a vast improvement over all the other bishops in the Catholic Church. But that's just my personal thing. Well, no, here's here's the history. Also, he believes in the monarchical that. Trinity. There mm. were two that I can recall attempts by emperors on the Byzantine side with some support uh, from clergy that, because the Catholics were saying, we'll come and help you, but you have to convert to Catholicism. And you know what? They were willing to do that, but it was the people. It was the people that said, no, you're not. No, we're not. So it wasn't that's the difference between the West with Catholicism. And I, it, what I'm saying is that Catholicism got it down to where it's the, the Pope, correct me if I'm wrong, Emma, is both the governing body and the religious leader. That didn't exist. E- even in America, where we what? said separation of church and state. Separation of church and state was already in the Orthodox world. Well, okay, you're 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 talking more along the lines of the papal states. This is over a hundred years ago. I, I'm yeah. just talking about the difference between we do things through council, 
And the reason why there has not been a council that has been recognized by the Orthodox after the seventh ecumenical council is for because for it to be an ecumenical council, you have to have the whole body. I would I would love yeah. to see a reunification of the Eastern Orthodox with with the Catholics. I really I think, would as well. I think the Oriental Orthodox is going to be reunify with the Eastern Orthodox before that ever happens. Yeah, it, I was actually a statement. I I say we're like uh, Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Christianity back together again. But no. I'm afraid you're happen, right, but I hope you're not. Yeah, I, I think it's a sad state. Well, the, no, told me I, I, I believe the Messiah will come and then all the Christians will come back into the fold. <laughs> the Messiah will come again. <laughs> all I know is Christ, uh, John said at the end, was it John that said at the end of his gospel, watch and pray. Mm -hmm. Watch and pray. I have a son. I have a brother-in-law that is just a uh, rapture kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, my gosh. It's like, watch and pray. It Just like death. Yeah, we're all going to die. We don't know when. We're all going to die our earthly lives. So the end will happen. But for us to be, get so consumed on that area, we're missing the mark. Going back mm -hmm. to we're sinning. It doesn't look like sin, but it's sinning against the church. I I was reading um, today. I, I tried reading up on the patriarch of Jerusalem. Uh huh. Oof. No, that's a mess. Mm. It's a real mess. Like that. Like huh? Yeah. Yeah, well, hold on. No, 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 no. It, it's, it's Eastern Orthodox. I have to say, the, the Christian, like, yes, the rabbinate is a huge mess, I have to say. But I was, I was reading about, like, trying to figure out who is the most, like, legitimate Eastern Orthodox, um, Eastern Orthodox, like, patriarch of Jerusalem. And wow, like, it's a real mess. It's a real, real. Well, this is why it's so important, just like with human beings. Mm -hmm. No patriarch has any jurisdiction over any other patriarch in the Orthodox world. Everything is done in council. Because I mean, that's it, real, real easy it, for you to say, but we have a Greek patriarch of Alexandria and a Coptic patriarch of Alexandria. Yeah, George, I, I have to say part part of what makes the Jerusalem patriarchate a, a mess is all the Greek priests coming and taking over. Like all the laity, they're all a Arabs and the entire hierarchy is Greek. And that's been causing, because it's a very, very wealthy patriarchate. And so like all these priests coming from Greece and like the, the bishops and all of them, and they're all kind of under the ecumenical patriarch's thumb. And like, it's, it's been, it's been a huge mess. It, it really has been. Well, the history of Christianity has been a huge mess. <laughs> The history so, of humanity but, but that, has but been a huge not, mess. That's not anyone's fault, but humanity yeah, mis yeah. missing the mark. Correct, correct. And what do we do when people or groups miss the mark? We pray. We pray. <laughs> and yep. as far as our relationship with them, you know, we try to influence them, whatever. Um, yeah, you know. And well, then when we look, but thank you for bringing uh, Andrew. That I love that name, by the way, because uh, Andrew? Andrew was Andrew was the first patriarch of uh, uh, Byzantium or Constantinople. You well, knew that, I, right? I, I I went to I went to Andrew's baptism. Uh, what has it been a month yet? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, and he chose to keep Andrew. Yeah. It it, it was. He, 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 he was, he, he was thinking about it, thinking about it. And then at, at the moment, the hegemon said, you're keeping Andrew. He said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I, I find it fascinating that, uh, Scotland 
for example, um, has as their patron saint, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, and, and when you look at the history um, of the Galatians, uh, which is actually Celtic, um, but they were in Anatolia at the time, but they migrated eventually up into what now is Scotland. Now that's my theory, because why do they have Andrew as their patron saint? Um, just, just one of those little. Richard Rolo would probably know. What's very that? few people, very few people are aware of this, but the British, um, the British flag. Is also is actually a combination of St. George's Cross and St. Andrew's Cross. Yeah, I was going to mention also uh, uh, with George, of course, that's my saint and uh, protector of the church. So uh, I couldn't have been given a better name because that's my whole life is defender have, of the church. Have Have you been to Georgia? Yeah, I've been to Georgia. My, uh, my neighbors across the street are Georgian, and they, in fact, just left this morning uh, to go back and visit uh, family. You know, George, um, Tim was talking about Burn um, earlier. Uh, you really, Burn Power, you really should check out his channel. He lives in Georgia, in uh, not American Georgia, in Georgia. Right. Georgia. No, I, 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 that's, what, that's what I was talking yeah. about. And, and he was, um, so he was involved in the uh, Jesus Freaks movement in the 60s and 70s. And you, you might actually really like his channel. Well, if you can post it on the chat. Uh, um, actually, Phil, uh, Tim uh, already did. It's called The Anadromist. Um, here. Say that again because. Uh, it's uh, The Anadromist. Burn Power. He's very popular in this little corner of the internet. I had him on my channel, um, and yeah, he um, uh, anadromist. So anadromous fish are fish that swim upstream. So that's where he got his name from. Okay. He, he he lived in Alaska for a long time. Um, but Burn Power is his name. And okay. He he's he he does a lot of interesting discussions. I think you would really. I actually think you and you and Burn might hit it off. Y you guys can reminisce about uh, about uh, what was the name of that uh, thing you went to? Uh, Woodstock. No, uh, no Wo Altamont. Woodstock Altamont. Yeah, Altamont. Stock of the West. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Now you guys need to go out, find a song on Google, look at the last <laughs> one. Uh, I think it's the fourth or fifth verse, mm. and that's exactly what I experienced. Um, I'm going to have to, because um, I have a brand new granddaughter, and my daughter is going to be calling me uh, any minute now. Mm. Uh, she hasn't called yet, but what a pleasure it is to join this group. It's great um, Jacob, you're yeah, correct. Great to talk to you. You, 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 I thought I talked a lot. Uh, uh, but you have very, very good points and challenges and what have you. And that's always good to have. Emma, oh, uh, very nice to meet you. I didn't get to nice hear to too meet much you from too. you. Uh, and the young guys, I um, I don't know what generation, but I actually hung out with uh, a young uh, man. He's only uh, 18 or 19. And so I asked him, oh, I feel just based upon what he was saying, are you a Gen Z? And he goes, yep, I'm proud of it. And I go, because yep. you are refreshing. You are not like, it. in fact, I could relate more to Gen Z and the thoughts that are coming out and their viewpoint than all the subsequent ones after boomers. <laughs> um, so anyways, I would very much like to hear uh, from Trey and, and Andrew more if, if, um, if they would be so kind to do that and brave to just push in and and share what your thoughts are. Uh, Thanks. We love talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say um, good night and we'll see you next Monday. Right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Good meeting you. Sure. Is it two? I yeah. think Tim said it was two Mondays. Tim does it every other Monday. Oh, I have other a other Monday. Hebrew Bible study every Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was kind of. 
maybe before I get off, because my my daughter hasn't called yet, um, is uh, why is it called the Greek Bible study? Because I have a Hebrew Bible study. Okay. Okay. So with the Hebrew Bible. And that's what I, that's what mine was on Wednesdays. And Tim decided he wanted to do New Testament and to, so mine is mostly actually like looking at the, well, it's supposed to be looking at the actual Hebrew and translations and things like that. My channel initially was just me teaching biblical Hebrew that, and it just, turned into this weird thing that it is. Okay, so the thought that I came up with is because we use the Septuagint, Mm -hmm. which is the translation of uh, of the Hebrew, because nobody was speaking Hebrew um, at the time of Christ, (laughs) uh, the the general population. So you might want to watch. I'll leave you with this. Have you you studied the things that have come out of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yes, that, we talk a lot about it. That the Masoretic text is a 6th century A.D. version. <laughs> I'm sorry. And that things out of the Dead Sea Scrolls actually... So, con- no. Con- yeah. No, 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 no. Just, uh, no your you're internet has... Out. You're cutting out. Your internet has I, I decided read, that yeah, you don't get I to get your read. word in edgewise this time. Say that. I highly recommend you watch the first um, the first Greek Bible study we had because um, that's part of what we started talking about. Okay, but, I just want yeah, to get no. clarity yeah, on no why we're calling that. it Greek Bible study and what have you. And yeah, we have more books go, go, than go, go, uh, go back. the Catholics have and more books than yeah. um, the uh, Protestants <laughs> have. George, go 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 look Does at Greek the first Orthodox six have more hour. books in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What book? Uh, I don't, well, uh, well, I have my haven't Bible you right seen here. Father Father Stephen's book, The Apocrypha? Father Stephen well, just trans just um, just uh, released, published yeah, a new yeah. book. Oh, it's right here. I thought yeah. Enoch was the only book that sometimes showed up. It, it's in not as Orthodox. only in this guy. <laughs> yeah, I can't. Okay. Yeah. There's so a time. There's a time. Uh, Orthodox Study Bible. Where? Which way do I go? Yeah. That's uh, and yeah, to Emma's question, uh, it has a list, and probably we have what? Uh, let's just say three or four more than Roman Catholic Old Testament. Uh, hmm. When I say books, I don't mean New Testament. That's sure. the yeah. same. I, and I then the highly, Protestant- highly recommend. I highly, highly recommend you watch the the first. Uh, by Greek Bible mm-hmm, study mm-hmm. we had. Yeah. It was okay. six hours long oh, and well. we had and we, I'm retired. Oh wow. Oh wow. Oh, oh he just summoned him. Oh, there's father and I things, have to go. Things got out of control. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I was about control. to end this stream, Father <laughs> Stephen. I could go if you want. No, no, don't you <laughs> I have to go. <laughs> father Stephen, nice to meet you. Good to meet you. <laughs> yes. I'm trying as a cradle Orthodox <laughs> that born in this country around Roman Catholics and Protestants and how my life was surrounded by that to where I did deep study for many, 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 many years of why the difference is. And I'll just end with eventually I stopped doing that. I don't read my wife used to say, can't you read anything other than, you know, theology or, you know, books on and and. Uh, well, I'm at the point, at least I have been the last five to 10 years, is that I know a lot of history. I know a lot about the differences between the faiths as much as one can uh, to where that's no longer where I'm at. Where I'm at is doing, is being what we're called to be, which is Christ-like. And no no theological dissertation with everyone I run into is going to result in anything but interesting arguments. Well, uh, F- Father Stephen, you have to understand, was was a Protestant minister, and now he's working on his second dissertation, and he writes books faster than I can read them. He is now an Antiochian archpriest. Okay. 
Well, I I really do look forward to seeing all of you again. And I'm just uh, impressed you're at Altamont. That's my thing. You're depressed? <laughs> I'm impressed. You, oh, impressed. <laughs> well, why does that, you know, I always say my father was a retired Marine, 22 years in the Marine Corps, 20 years in the Sheriff's Department. He was at Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Saipan, Tinians. And that's to get excited about. I mean, that what a terrible thing. But now I have the next generation after me going, you were at Altamont? I can't believe it. And I'm like going. When, <laughs> when I met Father Peter Gilquist. Oh, know, okay. We yeah. were there and everything. Yeah. I remember, going, oh, what was it like coming to the other? What was it like? When I met him, he wrote a biography of Johnny Cash. Really? Back when he was a Protestant. And when he wrote it, <laughs> he went and lived with Johnny. Man. For like a month. And so when I met him, I was just like, tell me about Johnny Cash. Like, I don't care about that. <laughs> like, uh, interesting. That's funny. That's very yeah. funny. Um, yeah. And I told everybody on, oh, so you must have heard on the Altamont yeah, about yeah. Don McLean and his, uh, yeah, I can still hear people saying, oh, come on, George. And I go, well, somebody else at least documented what I saw and what I experienced. And I think the Lord for uh, giving me that ability to discern. Even if I follow through on certain things, I know that I'm going down a path I shouldn't be going down. Uh, Lord have mercy on me. I'm going to let you guys go. What a pleasure. I'll see you in two weeks, hopefully. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Good meeting you, George. Good meeting you too. Good night. And just for Father Stephen, Happy Cam is back. Oh, <laughs> Happy Cam. I have missed Happy Cam. Mm -hmm. It was one of the best value-added features of your show. <laughs> like, you ought to set up a Patreon and have the Patreon be, you get to see the Happy Cam. <laughs> <laughs> um, so people have told me I, I should set up Patreon and stuff. Um, I generally, generally dislike the idea of uh, getting paid for teaching biblical Hebrew. Right. But they're not paying for that. They're but you could for get happy camp. paid for showing video of happy. Yeah. <laughs> you could even set I, it up as her channel. I'm her just waiting channel. for Shadow to crawl into bed with, with happy. Mm. So then Aww. I can say cats and dogs are living together peacefully. Mass hysteria. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. The, the Messiah is... is, is so people have been complaining that you haven't been showing up, Father Stephen. And I said, he might be just busy with actually being an archpriest and writing more books faster than I can read them. Probably, yeah. <laughs> There's, I, yeah, tons of stuff. But, um, well, plus, like, and you haven't been on as much because you were traveling and stuff. But a lot of times, like, if you're on and there's a good conversation going on, I don't want to interrupt it. Mm -hmm. But we have people saying crazy things like we use the Greek and the Masoretic text of the sixth century. <laughs> like, <laughs> somebody has to do something, right? Well, like, <laughs> so George, George is a cradle. Yeah, uh, no, I know. Orthodox. No, I, know. I know. Yeah. And, and like you've explained many times before, this is something that, had, that was often said, especially, I mean, he comes from a Greek background. Yeah, yeah. There's this urban legend stuff, yeah. <laughs> and that's not the craziest thing I've heard. I had a, I had a cra cradle Lebanese Orthodox guy tell me that the whole Bible was written in Byblos. That's how it got its name. <laughs> in, in Aramaic by the Phoenicians. And then they gave it to the Greeks who translated the whole thing into Greek. That's like, interesting. Very interesting. I haven't heard that before. <laughs> Reminds me of uh, teaching Latin camps for eight to eleven year olds today. I heard so many facts about Julius Caesar that I never yeah. knew. <laughs> he invented salads. <laughs> <laughs> like how he was married to Cleopatra. Oh yeah, and um, well, that was probably the parents not wanting to explain extramarital relations. Yeah, that well, probably well, they got was. married. That's how that happened. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's yeah. Well, but Mark Antony is still in there. 
Yeah, I know. Yeah. So Father Stephen had Harry I tried to be in there and failed. It right? was settled <laughs> that um, Cleopatra really loved Mark Antony because she had more kids with Mark Antony. That makes sense. But, yeah. So ha have I ever told cute. you the story of the time I was arguing with some people about religion in Spanish? No. So when when I was in junior high school, I was learning Spanish, and um, there were there was a Catholic and a Protestant student who were arguing in Spanish about religion, and I got in there and I, I was saying this and that and. Towards the end of it, one of them said, I forget which one it was, let's say it was the Catholic, says, You're, you must be Catholic. To, uh, you, you, you really know your religion. Like, nope, not Catholic. <laughs> the other one's like, see, you must be Protestant. You really, like, nope, not Protestant. The, Bible. the two of them couldn't even imagine, like, what could you possibly be if you're not <laughs> Catholic or Protestant? And I said, soy judío. I'm Jewish. Them. Jacob, I'm not doubting that this is a real thing that happened to you, but also it sounds like one of those rabbinic stories <laughs> that gets passed around like all the time. This actually happened to me. Yes. And know. that's totally acceptable, by the way. <laughs> stories just tell better in the first person sometimes. <laughs> so Any preacher who doesn't agree with that publicly is just a liar. <laughs> so he, he goes, no, you're not. Like, yes, I am. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah, I am. He's like, no tienes cuernos. <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't have horns. <laughs> like, and I start trying to explain to him, no, like, being like Moses Jewish is a religion, just like anybody else. And the other guy comes to my defense. He's like, yeah, my dad told me Jews are just people who believe in Judas. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I mean, Judaismo. Yeah. Judas <laughs> makes perfect sense. Yeah. A couple other people with that same name, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I was actually looking up the history of the patriarchate in, in Jerusalem today um, because I've, I've, I've actually been like pondering the type of stuff you, you've been talking about. And um, one of the last patriarchs before the Muslims, his name was Judas. And it's like, really? Judas is patriarch of like, I, I didn't think many Christians took that name. Yeah, well, there's, so, uh, you'd have to find out. Like, there's St. Jude, who wrote the book of Jude in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. The brother of Jesus. Um, so, people take his name. That would probably be the most common one for a Christian to take. Now, it's traditional, it is especially traditional in monasticism in the Holy Land, for monastics to take Old Testament saint names. So it's not impossible. Might uh, actually be even Judah, you mean? Might be Old Testament Judah, yeah. Uh -huh. And Judas is just the Greek form of the name. Because Greek names have to end with a sigma. Really? Yeah. Yeah, Judas' uh name was just Judah. I, I didn't realize the sigma was was mandatory. Yeah, it just gets tacked on. Like Elijah is Elia, it becomes Elias in Greek, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because Greek also conjugates names, so <laughs> you have to be able to do nominative genitive, right? Jesus, Jesus. Yeah, so. Oh, so Sorry. actually, okay. So <laughs> Judas was Judas Judah Kyriakos, 
also uh, popularly as uh, Judas of Jerusalem, was the great grandson of Jude, brother of Jesus, and the last Jewish bishop of Jerusalem. So this was actually okay. the second temple. So he was uh, going back to uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Yeah, so he, he was actually a direct descendant of uh, of Jude, the brother of Jesus. Okay. Who's the other brother of Jesus who became the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> patriarch of, uh, of Jerusalem. And I wasn't aware that it became part of the Pentarchy like in the 5th century or something. Yeah. Um, because it wasn't even the metropolis. Because after the Romans got done with Jerusalem, <laughs> it's right, like it was not the major city of the province. So they renamed the province from Judea to Palestina, right? And, and, and the metropolis, the metropolitan of Caesarea, was the one who, right, right. And so they made it post. Constantine post Saint Helen coming and tearing down the pagan temples and mm -hmm. right reinitializing the holy sites. Um, they at um, I think it was at Chalcedon uh, that they it was either at Ephesus or Chalcedon that they made it honorarily gave it honorarily the fifth place. Uh, Jerusalem, yeah, or as they called it then, Alia. Yeah, the fourth. <laughs> yeah. Fourth yeah. Ecumenical Council in 451. Yeah, Chalcedon. Yeah. Yeah. The the Bishop of Jerusalem was elevated to the rank of so, so Andrew may not acknowledge the Bishop yeah. of as being anything special. I don't know. Well, apparently there was Coptic patriarch of of Jerusalem as well. No, I thought Armenian. Apparently that too, but I don't know. I, I was I was trying to figure it out. Apparently, the vast majority of Christians in Israel are um, Melkites, which is Byzantine yeah. Catholics. Right. Yeah, they're a group that broke off in the 18th century from the Patriarchate of Antioch. Yeah, that I found that Pope. really interesting. Yeah, yeah. It came under the Pope. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're they're yeah. kind of like so. Are, it, it, is are there horrible relations with Antioch? Okay, relations with Antioch. No. Relations? Well, there's sort of yeah. There's sort of there's sort of no relations up above on okay. the ground. You know, um, there are pretty good relations, and the Mi Middle Eastern Christians tend to just see themselves as Middle Eastern Christians. Yeah. Especially the ones in majority Muslim countries, <laughs> you know, yeah. they're in, sort of less concerned about the fine distinctions. <laughs> in know, in the Iran, the word for Christian everybody uses is Armenian. Hmm. Yeah, that's just how you say Christian in Farsi, basically in po in popular language. Yeah, well, the t the term Melkite, ironically, before that was a slang term for. Um, for Orthodox um, Christians from non-Chalcedonians. Yeah. I, I from Melki, it's like you're with the king, right? Meaning the Byzantine emperor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. These Orientals making all the problems. <laughs> yeah, just stirring the pot all over, all over yeah. the Mediterranean basin. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm not very happy with Chalcedon. <laughs> hey, <loves> you. you. <laughs> that, we're, we're, we're going to have to. Uh, we're going to have to have a uh, Archbishop, of, a, a Patriarch of Jerusalem, be the Pope of everybody soon enough. So. We'll yeah, that's what Father out. Stephen DeYoung says. You know. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you like? How do you envision that happening? Do you, do you like? Do you see that as a miraculous thing possibly happening, or how how, how do you think that, that would that would be a miraculous <laughs> thing? It would be a miraculous. Because yeah, this, this is miraculous from my perspective. It, from your perspective, it might be the great apostasy. 
the greater mass of Jewish people uh, accepting <laughs> Jesus as the Messiah. But uh, <laughs> from, from my perspective, that would be a miraculous event. I don't think. Well, Rome's okay, give up let's their, uh, let's say place. the chief rabbinates tomorrow. They're like, not part the chief, of this anyway. Let, let, let's say the chief rabbi tomorrow claims that claims he believes Jesus is the Messiah. I have a very hard time seeing the rest of the world's Christians <laughs> following along, especially the Patriarch of Moscow. <laughs> It would depend. Well, well, there would there would be politicking involved, right? <laughs> but I think you underestimate the current resentment against the Patriarch of Constantinople. Uh, <laughs> I, I was Who wants I, to be the Pope very much. I was reading so the Greek Orthodox Church in Israel, like basically, like. It owns, it's like one of the biggest landowners in the state of Israel. For now, yeah. <laughs> Every time there's a new patriarch, the Israeli government, like, you know, so the way it's, the way all their statutes are set up was from under the Turks, under the Ottomans. Right. And so, therefore, the, the election has to be approved by the civil authority. Right. And so every time there's a new patriarch of Jerusalem, the Israeli government says, yeah, we'll approve you if right? <laughs> you sell us this. Well, of the head. Apparently, the previous one, the most recent one was deposed like in 2007 because he yes. sold land. To yes. And so and so there's always this tension. Right. And because and apparently they're yeah. all Greek priests. Yes, they're all Greeks. Um. Because I doubt the Israeli government right now would approve a Palestinian to be patriarch of Jerusalem. Honestly. <laughs> <Somehow>. <laughs> um, I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> I, I really wonder why they don't just eminent domain a lot of, I mean, owned by a church, like, I really wonder why they don't eminent domain a lot of the land because it's not like these lands are like churches or anything right these if it's are... churches and monasteries and holy sites that's one thing if it's just we're extracting rent that's another thing so israel's knesset officially is uh, is built on <laughs> land leased from the greek orthodox church <laughs> so as 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 a dutch person i can't knock the hustle right like, but <laughs> <laughs> so there's apparently, like, in the 1940s, there was a 99-year lease, <laughs> and Israel decided to build its legislature <laughs> on, on this 99-year lease. Well, I'm sure with inflation and everything, they've made out like bandits, though, on that lease <laughs> for that long. That's... <laughs> I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, uh, you want to, you want to talk about your hate crime against Anselman? What was my hate crime against Anselman? Oh, right. The, <laughs> the, 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 the idea that, uh, sure, we can talk about that. Uh, so, uh, just to, just to get people up to speed, there's been <laughs> your a, hate crimes. <laughs> there, there has been a conversation in this little corner about uh, sex positivity and sex negativity, which I think is a very poor use of term. I, I, I would much rather talk about marriage positivity and marriage negativity as opposed to, because celibacy isn't only a question of chastity, right? So Judaism is pro-chastity, not pro-celibacy. And I think that's different. And so well, there's different than some folks, yeah. Yeah. So well, depending. I mean, these yeah. words. Uh, but Jewish theology is very, very well. Pharisaic Jewish theology is very clearly pro-marriage, um, and I believe this is 
basically what the Hebrew Bible very clearly teaches. And um, I actually think that the sayings of Jesus I've seen in the Gospels, which are talking about the possibility, like they are very pro, um, even if you are not married, you are still part of the kingdom of God which is a Pharisaic teaching in a particular context against Sadducees and Samaritans and other forms of Jews. And we can get into the Essenes and the chastity of, of James the Just later. Uh, but I, I started understanding that a lot better after I found out that they really seemed to believe that they were looking at an imminent eschaton. Because to, to be lot as Ezra, right, this concept that sexual um, marital relations uh, defile you in a certain, from ritual impurity, right? That's actually how the rabbis understand uh, Miriam's discussion with Aaron in, uh, regarding Moses, right? That is definitely a concept within Judaism, right? We, we do have this concept that, yes, there is a sort of ritual defilement that is entailed in marital relations. Yeah, with bodily fluids leading the body, leaving the body. Exactly. Blood, yes. semen, anything. Yeah, That's right. anything, yeah. right. And, and so um, in the midst of this discussion, I brought up um, I brought up uh, Shulchan Aruch Evan Haezer one one, which is the first halacha in the section of the uh, the code of Jewish law, which you could compare to a catechism for Orthodox Judaism, is in four sections, and I brought up the section where it has very very nasty things to say about people who are not married. And including they are like murderers and they make uh, the Shekinah flee from Israel and they reduce the countenance of God. And lo mikra adam is the actual term, which I translated as is not considered a human being. Um, right? Pretty strong pro-marriage uh, language. And Anselman thought this was obscenity and hatred of Jesus. Um, which, I mean, look, I, I, I think that is a valid way of reading. Um, I mean, there, there is a definite Jewish rejection of the idea that Jesus, as an unmarried man, as somebody who was not actually a father, and you can spiritualize away things all you like, but he wasn't a father, the idea that he was the ideal man um, is just not something that follows along with a Jewish ideal of man and being Betsela Meloki. Yeah. So I think we've, we've talked before in some circumstance that uh, – Christ wasn't celibate in the way that term gets used later. I find it ironic that you have Protestants defending like the Roman Catholic version of celibacy to you all of a sudden too. That's fascinating. But um, Anselman is a strange what, guy. What I, is I, Anselman? He confuses an me so much. He's an really? Anglo-Catholic, so he doesn't know what he is. He's half it's, Protestant, it's, half Catholic. It's beyond that. He talks like a sede. <laughs> he's confused. That's why I feel perfectly justified in telling him to shut up. <laughs> no, seriously. But, yeah. There, there are things like on the internet, there are way it, it, it is impossible to signal to other people the way, like if the five of us were sitting in a room, right? And Father Stephen and I were talking and Anselman said, made one of his stupid comments, like Father Stephen doesn't know anything about, uh, uh, Christianity, which he has said. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> and the five of us would kind of all look at him and be like, okay, you need to shut up now. In, in a very polite, nice manner. 
but in a way that it would be very clear, okay, you just said something really stupid and you need to stop saying these stupid things over and over again. But what happens on the internet is when someone says something so stupid that nobody else wants to reply, they think, boom, <laughs> I silenced, nobody could answer me. And it's like, no, you just said something so stupid, nobody thought they should yeah. answer you. But yeah, but um, yeah, so <laughs> the, so the Christ is enacting in his life being the bridegroom. And there is a pretty, I mean, read his word. He, he refers to himself as the bridegroom all the time. Right? Really? When, I, when I the Pharisees ask why his disciples don't observe the fast, he says the friends of the bridegroom do not fa fast while he is with them. But when he is departed from them, then they fast. Right. And in his parables, he refers to himself as the bridegroom. This is drawing on stuff in fourth Ezra and the vision of the bridegroom uh, or second Ezra, depending on how you number it. This is a theme, right? In, in Orthodox Holy Week, the services on the first three days are called the bridegroom mass, right? Like this is, this is a theme, right? And I think there's a framework for that within uh, Judaic prophetism, right? Because compared to a lot of the things enacted by a lot of the prophets, even vis-a-vis -vis marriage, Hosea, that's not even extreme, right? <laughs> Enacting being a bridegroom. So what right? do you think about the marriage With chase, between... Right? What, what do you think about the marriage between Jesus and Mary being symbolically necessary? What do you think of that? Mary like his mother? Yes. No, I don't think that's symbolically necessary. Okay. Yeah, no, no, not at all. I think I think Mary is very clearly the reason her, her early significance that we know already from the second century is because they had the idea of the Gibura from the line of from David's line of kings, where you announce the name of the mother, right? So if they think he's the Davidic Messiah, then his mother is important, right? See, That's... I when I first heard about this concept of Gevira, so Gevira, like, there, just to explain to people, in the Bible, with the mothers of uh, certain kings, Judah, it, it, the line of Judah, it, it, it mentions that their mother's name. Now, for me, this is kind of like, Queen Mother, okay, this is like the for the king to be um, actually respectful of his mother, if she is still alive, makes perfect sense. And I don't view it as some sort of office or necessity or the type of thing that I've heard you kind of make. But but it but it was in the text. I mean, mean, I know knock is for girls, right? But <laughs> <laughs> But this is an office, right? Uh, Solomon has a throne brought out for Bathsheba to sit in. As She's his, his mother. As his closest advisor, number one. Number two. She's his mother. Number two, Athaliah. Okay. I don't I don't even know that name. Okay. Or what? Ataliah? Okay. I'm trying to think what the Hebrew pronunciation would be. Again, you have to realize Nach, Nach, Nach is, really is for girls. Is exactly. for girls. Right. I, so I she, don't know my was, Nach very well. She was from a uh, Ahab's family. Okay. From the clan of Omri in the north. Okay. But married, married into the Davidic line. Okay. And became the queen mother. If, and proceeded to try to exterminate using her power in that role. Okay. Try to exterminate the line of David. Okay. In Second Kings. Okay. So this was a role that had power, that had political power. This well, I not, mean, the king's mother has political office. power. I, I, I don't see how this is separate from the fact that she's the king's mother. Well, why didn't they have that in the northern kingdom? Why didn't they have that? Because they weren't as good to their moms. This because they, because they, they, they did not follow the Ten Commandments as they should have. <laughs> no, like in the, it, well, that's certainly true. 
But in the Northern <laughs> Kingdom, in the Northern Kingdom, the queen was the king's favorite wife, not his mother. So like Jezebel, right, was the queen, mm -hmm. right? Ahab's favorite wife, right? He had others, but that was right. she was the one he favored for whatever reason, right? In Judah, the one who had the power of the queen was the mother of the current of the current king. And all I'm saying is, mm -hmm. this is something specific, an institution specific to the line of David. And so if you are a Jewish person who thinks that Jesus is the Davidic Messiah, you would accord Mary the kind of honor, including referring to her as queen, if you think Jesus is king and Messiah, right? Okay. That you would to the Davidic line. I'm, I'm right? just I mean, finishing up uh, the Jesus Dynasty by James Tabor. And um, I mean... He obviously his his he has a book coming out on Mary actually, um, and he obviously has a lot of um, respect for Mary. It's I mean obviously a woman who had three sons who were I mean James Jude like she was an important person. It's but um, like. I don't even understand how that works with this concept that she was uh, a virgin after uh, she gave birth to Jesus. Because, like, really, James and Simon were both not not actual brothers of Jesus. They were Joseph's sons from a previous. From, from a previous, pre so they would have to be older than Jesus. Yes. Yeah, the Orthodox icon of the flight into Egypt shows St. James leading the donkey that pregnant, or that not pregnant Mary, that Mary and Jesus are sitting on. Simon, Simon was, was, uh, when, when, when did Simon stop being patriarch? Like around 90? Could be, yeah. Makes him really, really old if yeah. he's older than. If he's older than Jesus, <laughs> yeah, and he was patriarch into like, yeah. I guess I could look up. But we know that we know that about Jesus' brothers from the same sources that tell us that Simon was patriarch. Um, Simeon of Jerusalem <laughs> was bishop from sixty three to either one hundred and seven or one hundred and seventeen. Yeah. But those dates are from the same sources that tell us that these are Jesus' older siblings. And when do you think they were born? Joseph uh, was dead. Well, Joseph died why, before Jesus did. Well, this is this is why uh, <laughs> th this is this is why um, James Tabor believes that Clophas, the brother of. Uh, Joseph married Mary. Right, but there's no source for that. Hmm. No, there's not. There is no. And there's no source, source says, for it. But there's it, no it, ancient source that says that. <laughs> right, but it makes sense. Well, if we're talking about what's possible, I mean, all <laughs> kinds of things are possible, right? I mean, it's okay. possible that they were virgin births. It's possible that they're his cousins. It's possible that, you know. Well, if we're going with okay, possible. most people would not say <laughs> it's possible they were virgin births because most people believe Jesus' virgin birth was unique, which I realize you you know better than. Well, the uh, yes, I know. Yes, yeah. Isaiah seven. But for most Christians, when I point out that Isaiah seven. To be about Jesus would I'm, have to be about Jesus also. Yeah, yeah. They lose their mind. Yeah. <laughs> but so this is one of the problems. This is this is one of the problems. This is why we don't have the holy family icons that Roman Catholics do. Mm -hmm. That portray Joseph as a young man. Because there's a theology of sexuality expressed there. That Joseph and Mary are the ideal young couple because they never had sex, even though they were married. Hmm. And we reject hmm. that. 
mm. right? Because I, the most the ancient documents say that Saint Joseph was an elderly man. That that Mary mm. had been brought to the temple by her parents mm. because they were elderly when they had her and prayed for a child because her mother Saint Anna had been barren. They gave her to the temple, but then when she reached the point of menstruation, she couldn't be around the temple anymore. Okay. That and so she was betrothed to... I am not aware of, like, this being a Jewish as opposed to a Greek thing of bringing orphans to the temple. Well, no, it's not an orphan. It's like Samuel. Samuel there were the women was at the serving gate. in the right. temple. There were women at the gates of the tabernacle. Second Maccabees refers to the women who are doing that at the temple as the virgins at the temple. I don't know second. I know Second Maccabees even less than I know. Uh, yeah. Thing. yeah. That doesn't mean they were they're, they're not. Now you get this Christianized version of it where there were like nuns, right? <laughs> like at the temple, which is not the case, right? Mm -hmm. But that there were, it was usually older women. Okay. Right. Who were widows or whatever and didn't have anyone to look so after them who would widows, go to the temple and would help. And, right. So yeah. widows and the elderly in general going to Jerusalem. Now that's an ancient Jewish. Thing. Right. Right. And so the idea was Mary start, reaches the age of menstruation. She has to leave. Right. She can't be on the temple grounds anymore with the idea that she was going to return. Hmm. Right, she was planning to later in life return to the temple, right? Okay. And this comes from the New Testament text that she was planning to return. If you read it closely, <laughs> right? Um, because when the Archangel Gabriel comes to the Theotokos and tells her she's going to have a child, okay, and she says, "How can this be? Because I have not known a man." And she's betrothed. Do you think she was stupid? <laughs> Did you think she didn't know where babies came from? <laughs> if she was planning on having a normal married life, she right. would have said, oh, okay, you mean with my fiancé, right? We're going to get married and we're going to have a baby. Right. She wouldn't say, how is that possible? Right? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> right. Unless her plan had been, mm -hmm. no, I'm not planning on having a normal married life. Mm -hmm. Right? I am not aware of anything in Jewish tradition like this idea of she gets betrothed, not like this idea of like getting betrothed without a concept of you're going to have a normal uh, married life afterwards. I'm not saying she's not unique. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it wasn't a unique situation. Um, but the idea that she would be protected, you know, you know, she has to be under some man's authority in order to have legal rights. What do you think about, like, getting married in your old age? Like... What, like in life in general? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm asking Jacob, like, oh, <laughs> is that? Well, I mean, you, oh, I mean, getting married, you, every, so within Judaism, certainly modern Judaism, but also ancient Judaism, it was always considered, you know, everyone should be married. Everyone should be married. That's, that is, so the concept of being only human when you are married is very deeply ingrained in Judaism. Like, you are considered a full human being when you are married because each of you are half of a human being. So did the, like, never happen? Like, nobody ever made it to old age without being married, or...? There are there are instances of rabbis who are called out in the Talmud, like this guy never got married. Like, 
<laughs> wow. Like, well, and that's, that's what St. Paul was having to do. This gets pulled out of context and misquoted, but St. Paul was having to defend the fact that he wasn't married. That, he said, I mean, St. Peter is married and has kids. He says, St. James is married and has kids. Right? These people are married and have kids. You know, And he's like, I could do that too, but here's why I don't. He has to go and justify himself for not being married. In context, you know? <laughs> those pro-celibacy things that Jesus and... Um, and Paul say, in a Jewish context, they're actually very rabbinic because yeah. the rabbis similarly defended people who weren't married as not completely worthless. <laughs> right? And But in a Gentile context, uh, like, that was taken to be a completely different understanding because it was just so outside the Jewish biblical understanding of, like, to be a human being is to be married. Right. Right. And St. Paul says, let each man have his own wife. He says the, mar the marriage bed is holy and undefiled, right? Like, this isn't, isn't a thing. Where, so there's two different, there, there's the, the, the celibacy issue. And the way that actually comes about in Christian monasticism is if you look at very early Syriac sources about Syrian monasticism, uh, it comes from this comparison they made. So first of all, they refer to the earliest monastics as Christian Nazarites. That's the term they use, Christian Nazarites. Um, and because of that, they make this comparison between Samson and St. John the Baptist or St. John the Forerunner, both of whom were Nazarites. And they say Samson ends up breaking all of his Nazarite vows, right? Like everything he was promised to do for birth, he didn't do it, right? What after the other. St. John did, right? He remained holy and stuck to this for his whole life. And this is in the sources, like Afrahat, right? So what's the, what's the big difference in the life between the two? St. John was chased. What got Samson into trouble over and over and over and over again, right? His love of Philistine women <laughs> right? in general, right? Prostitutes in particular, right? And so they draw this comparison, and so there becomes this emphasis on these Christian Nazarites who are the first Christian monastics being chased. Because they think if you're not chased, all these other things are going to follow, right, in terms of your other, your other vows. Right? And this is true. It's very clear at this early stage, but you even see it later. There's a letter that St. Jerome writes to this guy because there was a guy who was saying, hey, you know, this whole monasticism thing and being chaste is, you know, lame. I mean, look at Samson, right? He was a Nazarite. He got around, right? He had a good time. And <laughs> so and so St. Jerome had to write this letter, like, excoriating him and being like, no, 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 you're reading this all wrong, right? <laughs> like, this is not, you know, Samson's not being held up as like a role model, right, of how you should live your life, right? So uh, I actually want to ask you about this. Yeah. Um, so Netzer and Nezer, right? A Zion and a Tzadi really aren't as close as a lot of people seem to want to make them. Yeah. <laughs> um. And being able to tell the difference between a Tzadi and, an, uh, and a Zion is kind of like, I mean, I, I can't imagine, right, that the mistakes people make when they transliterate Hebrew and use a Z for both, yeah, yeah like, that's a bit much. <laughs> um, and the word for uh, Christian in Hebrew um, already in the Talmud is Nutsri. Yeah. Um, 
the, the word in Arabic is similarly uh, Nasara, right? With a, with a Saudi, not with a um, Zion. Um, and it just seemed to me like the combination of Nezer and Netzer. Um, I, I don't know how early it is. I mean, it sounds like you're, you're kind of saying, um, you're kind of saying that Jerome already was making some form of equivalence there. Um, no, no, no. I'm not saying they're the same word. Okay. No, no, no. They have a, a word for Christian, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? and then a word for Nazarite. Okay. As opposed to Jewish Nazarites. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. And then that's what Christian monasticism develops out of. That okay. There were Christians taking Nazarite vows. Okay. At that so, very early stage. So, do you believe that when uh, we talk about Nazareth, right? Was that Netzeret? Was that a branch? No, I, that... I, no, I think, I think that's fiddling. <laughs> Are you talking about the place where it's where that's applied to Jesus and it says, yeah, you know, right? And me. and I mean, yeah. people refer to Jesus as the Nazarene. I don't know if that's from a Christian, yeah. the Christian Bible or not. Um, it's from English translations, right? Okay. So it's it's he's from Nazareth. <laughs> right, the village, yeah. and that's a little fast. So one of the one of the many undercurrents in the Gospels is the fact that Jesus was known to everybody as Jesus of Nazareth, and other Jewish people comment all the time, like, "What prophet is supposed to come from Nazareth?" Right, or like <laughs> the Messiah is not gonna, or just straight out, "What good has ever come from Nazareth?" Right, right? and. So this is one of the big evidences, actually, to me, that Jesus of Nazareth is a historical person. Because if you were going to invent or even composite, as you've proposed, a person, you would just say he was from Bethlehem, right? <laughs> like, you wouldn't say, oh, yeah, there's Jesus of Nazareth, but trust me, he's really from Bethlehem, right? Why would you cause that problem for yourself? So, if, for, <laughs> right, this wasn't uh, a known person. So I have to wonder if Hanotsri, if Netzer were, were, see, I am wondering if Notsri doesn't come from Linsor, meaning to keep, as in Psalm 119, keeping the Torah and things like that, and that was later discarded. Well, I mean, it's very clear in the text of the Gospels that it's they're a using it as Jesus is from this place called Nazareth. Right. That, that's not just a title ascribed to him. Mm. So at least as early as the writing of the Gospels, right, that is is that he's from this place, Nazareth. And the mm. Gospels themselves reflect that that's a problem from the perspective of getting Jewish people to believe he's the Messiah. <laughs> Right. Which I don't understand because James Tabor actually, so he makes it sound like Natseret comes from um, Netzer as in um, a branch and that he thinks it was a place known to be people who were descended from David. That would... I mean, that would be news to the writers of the gospel. Yeah. The gospels. <laughs> like, they would well, have loved, they would have loved to have that bit. <laughs> that would have helped them a lot. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, James Tabor's theory is very much in line with um, with Robert Eisenman's in that he believes that Christianity was hijacked by Paul and right. that Greek Christianity is a completely different animal from G. Right. But like, St. Paul never refers to him as Jesus of Nazareth. That's the Gospels. Okay, but doesn't that... That's, well, I mean, Paul doesn't seem to have any details about Jesus. Well, he, he does. So, Other than being crucified. 
Well, yeah, that's a big one. But <laughs> and rising again from the dead. Yeah. Um, but also, um, I think born of, when when he says that Christ that Jesus was born of a woman. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, uh, I think he, in his mind, is uh, pointing back to uh, Genesis 3, but I think there may be, he may have at least been familiar of the tradition of the virgin birth. I don't know that he's alluding to it there for sure, but he may have been familiar. He definitely, he talks about Christ's circumcision, so he definitely is positing Christ as being Jewish and as keeping Torah, (laughs) right? Like, I mean, that's, so those are details of his life. But in terms of the place name Jesus Jesus of Nazareth and Nazareth being a place name, that's not something that comes from St. Paul. That's something that comes from the Gospels. Mm -hmm. So if your idea is that, like, say, St. Matthew's Gospel is Jewish and primitive, and then St. Paul takes it in another direction, trying to argue that Nazareth isn't a place name doesn't really fit with that. It would seem to argue the opposite. So the Gospel of Matthew refers to him from uh, yeah. Nazareth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, born of women, like Jesus refers to um, Saint John. Yeah. Among men born of women. Yeah. That yeah. is greater than John. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, like, like I said, that doesn't I, seem to be a unique title. <laughs> No, no, but I think I think he's in the context. I think St. Paul's trying to allude to Genesis 3. That's why I said it's a weak case that St. Paul knew about the virgin birth tradition mm. at that point. Gospels hadn't been written yet when he said that. But um yeah, I get I get called the I get called the liberal for saying the gospel started to be written in, in 69 AD. Well, only it's Luke, like me and the church fathers, I guess. Um, well, only Luke, <laughs> Luke and Matthew have the virgin birth and yeah, have Matthew, the birth narrative at all. And and Matthew, um, I mean, that's we yeah. know the the first few chapters were not accepted by at least some Christians. Well, that's debatable. That's highly debatable. Really? Like, yeah. The Ebionites? Yeah. There are a bunch of, hi- yeah. So there's this hypothesized Aramaic original of St. Matthew's Gospel that is based on a comment from Papias that's only preserved in a quotation in Eusebius mm. <laughs> from the fourth century that there was this Aramaic original. And yet, scholars speculate about the contents. That's why well, that's what scholars are meant to do. I know, but, but it's like Q. There's a critical edition of Q out there. Eusebius does make some stuff up. So yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a critical edition of, or some of it's just stuff he heard. He just wasn't very critical of traditions and things he heard. He was just like, oh yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> um, but also, there's a critical edition of J. Are you aware of that? They like the source for the Torah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't exist, right? Like it's a critical edition of a hypothetical text, right? One of one of these days, I'm gonna have to make a critical edition of like <laughs> academia. Yes, like so. Yeah, so that's that's how to. But one of the again the things about Jesus being from Nazareth is in the birth narratives in St. Matthew's gospel and St. Luke's gospel, they kind of handle he's really from Bethlehem differently. Like they don't outright contradict each other, Mm. but um, St. Matthew's gospel presents them as sort of living in Nazareth. St. Luke presents them as going because of the census, right? Uh, Back to Bethlehem and he's born. And then they go back to, uh, Oh, back to Nazareth, and then they go to Egypt, and then they go back to Nazareth. (laughs) So, yeah, there's like a bunch of trips. And it's kind of condensed, because we we take all the stuff, at least in Christian popular tellings of the story, we take all the stuff from Matthew and Luke and smush it all together. 
So we've got like the shepherds and the magi showing up at the same time. It's like, no, the magi showed up two years later, which means they showed up in Nazareth. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, but yeah. So we've, you know, draw that together, but it's actually separate, uh, separate tradition. So did we actually get to what you wanted to talk about as far as the... Oh, the Ansel, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so... <laughs> So yeah, um, I think what you're encountering there is coming out of Martin Luther, who's a former monk who married a former nun. There is a huge push, pushing back against what celibacy became in Roman Catholicism. And I was practiced in Roman Catholicism, which included mandatory clerical celibacy, for example. Right? Mm -hmm. um, pushing back against that in the direction of making marriage normative again. Mm -hmm. right. And that became such a push, right, that is still around in Protestant circles, especially evangelical Protestant circles to this day, where anybody who isn't married is seen as sort of a weirdo and a misfit. And like at the fringe of the community, I know, right? So when you said that, right, you're sort of playing into people's like trauma pathology. And especially if they're a millennial, they can't handle that. Right? Like, yeah, I, I, um, I really, I really wish, I mean, I, I, I don't know how much you pay attention to Doug Wilson. I'm guessing not much. Um, I'm familiar with him. <laughs> so he's, I mean, he, I, I think he's interesting when in many ways, he's the smartest, stupid person I know. <laughs> um, because like he sometimes he has these ideas and I wonder why he hasn't thought them through more than um, more than he has when he talks about like he, he talks about the the Christian magistrate anyway oh, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah that's a whole that was uh, the other thing I was gonna get into about marriage but anyway go ahead um, but he actually pointed out that apparently a lot of Christian churches um, were encouraging people to live this life of celibacy dedicated to the church. And now they have a bunch of old people who need to be taken care of. And as Protestants, they have zero capacity to take care of old single people who because they have no community to actually take care of the... Yeah, and yeah. our economy has destroyed the extended family. Yeah, and, and the extent... I mean, this was the craziest thing when I visited Paul Vanderclay. Uh, he told me his church is dying. And I'm like, your church is dying? Like, that's sad. And he said, no, that's, that's normal life cycle of a church. Yeah, Protestant churches have life cycles. Yeah. Right. And it's like. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Emma is shocked at this idea. Hey, oh, there was, I yeah, am. There was this meme I... a few years ago where this pastor, Protestant pastor, uh, I will let you talk, Emma, but I got to say, Jacob made the yeah. best video of all time. No, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, there was this, this pastor who, who opening this Protestant church plan and said in his opening like sermon, like this church is not going to be here forever, right? We're following this move of the Spirit. It's going to be this time. But, and he justified it by saying, you know, I mean, look at all the churches St. Paul planted, right? How many of those are still here? Or how many Paul planted? How many of those are still here? And so somebody took the meme of him saying that and then put like, the Bishop of Thessaloniki, the Bishop of Corinth, the Bishop of... <laughs> I honestly had no idea this was a, like, thing. Well, it's very convenient to go bankrupt at once your pastor reaches retirement age. And then just plant a new one? Yeah. Yeah. The... Um... Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so it's it's this this push and 
part of it is, I mean, I can identify with the pressure people feel because these texts we're talking about, whether we're talking about biblical texts or the Jewish texts you're talking about, Jacob, are all written in a world where uh, you had a marriage arranged for you by your parents when you were like 13, right? Like you'd be amazed how long it took me when I was going or through- Or younger. Yeah, going, th yeah, going through the old, might be arranged at birth right? <laughs> for when you were 13, yeah. Um, I'm trying to get that going in my congregation when I baptize babies. I'm just like pairing them off, parents talk. Um, but, but um, it, you'd be amazed how long it took when I was going through the Old Testament to explain what Proverbs meant when they were talking about like find love with the wife of your youth. You know, it was like, what? <laughs> you know, I was like having to explain once a man was older and more established, he might think he could do better, <laughs> right? Than the, the marriage his parents arranged for him. Right. Yeah. And, you know, get rid of her and, you know. Um, yeah, this thing of broken betrothals and like, yeah, th this is actually a, 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 like, no, I mean, honestly, arranged marriages, frankly, I, I think, so Jewish law is very clear that people have to consent to their marriage. Like this is something that the Talmud talks about a lot. The, the Jewish codes talk about a lot, but that's in a context of, well, I mean, you are actually going to marry the person you got set up with. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like we are insisting you must be able to consent and say no. Right. Mm. But, but, Unless there's some extreme circumstance, you know, that your parents are like unaware of that you need to tell them about. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And so I understand from the perspective of somebody in our late capitalist society where we've made marriage a free market like everything else. Right. Where you have to go out there as like a consumer and like show your wares and try and like, you know. And, and try and people who that hasn't happened for, when they hear these texts, right? I get why that weighs on them, right? I get why they have trouble engaging with them and accepting them. Yeah. You know, so I mean, I can kind of, I can kind of understand that, but I don't think the solution is to reject those texts, right? Or like, or 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 reject the reality and the importance of marriage. I think the answer is to start remolding our idea of the family, getting over this nuclear family idea, right? And so I, I started to, saying that the nuclear family is a nuclear disaster. Yeah. Yeah. And so if we can start getting past that and having real communities so that if there are people who aren't married, they still have a role in the family and in the community and this kind of thing then those texts become once the person is in that role and they know who they are and they know what their role is, they can hear those texts and say, well, yeah, it is the ideal that I, I should be married and should have children, but right. that's not I what mean, happened with me. And I still have this role in this place. Right. I, I, it was I pretty have great having a childless aunt. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I mean, I'm, 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 I have my nephews and, that's basically my my lot in life, hopefully. But yeah, um, just to address what Elijah has been saying in the comments, uh, yeah. So wealthy, irreligious congregations like Reform and conservative synagogues and mainline churches actually end up being very, very wealthy. Leave end up uh, not having anybody to fill the pews. And that's a whole different thing because they, there were no kids involved um, with with places like Paul's church. There were kids. It's just none of those kids go to that, those churches. Stuck around. Yeah. 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 And this is I don't know. I don't know if you did you watch uh, CRC Synod today? I didn't watch it. but I, OK. Yeah. yeah. You had your fill of the boomerism. Like they even had technological problems. Like it was just was like every Uber thing that could happen to you, right? Like um, they are so. It is so boomer. Yeah. Well, there was a there was a boomer millennial feedback loop at one point today. 
where, <laughs> right, <laughs> the, the millennial, this, you can tell when it's a millennial who's getting up to speak because they always start by describing some personal trauma they just went through. <laughs> because that, of course, gives them authority to speak, right? Yeah. That's why you should listen to them. So <laughs> you can always tell when that's Oh, happening. like in, in relation to the church? I anything. Or? Anything. My aunt died recently. Okay. <laughs> right? Like anything. So the way you said that, I thought it might be some sort of like, like excuse that like, like just happened. So like, oh, sorry. Like I got a flat tire on the way here or something. Like that. Yeah. No, this is, this is oh. like, I'm about to get up and talk about a procedural motion. But before I begin, let me tell you that my aunt just died. And it was really uh, rough because I loved my aunt. And it's been really hard for me. Now let me talk about the procedural motion. But uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right? With the presumption now you should listen to me. So there was a point where someone did that. And I'm not going to talk about what the trauma was because I'm not trying to make fun of that. But he, he starts that way and then says how, you know, going through all the hard times. Lots of people who have gone through a lot of very hard times who are very clearly upper middle class white people also. Who have, you know, broken and battered hearts and all this and, and all these horrible things. Um, but gets up and he says that and, and talks about how with all the things he's been going through, he felt like the church hadn't been responsive. And by the church hadn't been responsive, he meant the particulars of the worship service at his local church on Sunday morning was not responsive to what he was going through. Right. This triggered the boomer who was the chair to proceed to spend five minutes apologizing on behalf of the church and God and everyone that this person's needs hadn't been met. And it just created this feedback loop, this boomer millennial feedback loop between the two of them going back and forth. But anyway. Um, <laughs> I notice how Gen X is always like absent from these. Yeah, well, see, I'm Gen X, and that's because we opted out. We opted out of the whole thing. We just said, forget it. I was having this conversation with some of the some of the Zoomers at, at my church, and I said, you can tell a Gen X movie, because all Gen X movies, like from the 90s, are either completely sarcastic like everything is just ironic and sarcastic and nothing is sincere at all ever, right? Demolition Man, right? Reality Bites, like pick your movie. Or they're just bleak and terrible like Seven, right? Like those are the only two modes. Or they're both, like or We both Live. The same time. Yeah. Yeah, I just both. watched We Live. That was great, man. Thank you <laughs> for the recommendation. Oh, They Live? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was great. <laughs> um, yeah, so we cut, we kind of... We kind of opted out and uh yeah but so what what i what i was getting at with marriage is i think so today somebody had made a motion vis-a-vis -vis doing ecclesial marriages is what they were calling them or ecclesiastical marriages where you get married in the church and not civilly Technically speaking, I only do ecclesial marriages by that standard. Like if somebody wants me to sign a marriage license, I will. But that's like secondary. I'll sign a thing saying, yeah, I did a wedding for these people, right? But, yeah. and if someone doesn't care about that, I don't care about that, right? I'm doing the sacrament of holy matrimony, right? But in the CRC... You can't. They were like, no. There'll be legal problems. This is an issue of the civil magistrate. This will be, mm -hmm. and, and this is the position of Protestantism since the Reformation, has been that marriage is not a sacrament. Right. It is a civil institution. It is a function of the civil magistrate. That's why you had in the United States, probably still to this day, by the power vested in me, by the state of whatever, I pronounce you man and wife. That's part of the religious ceremony? Yeah, the churches. Wait. The churches. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought that was just a thing that people who didn't actually get married no. churches did. No, Protestant churches. 
because they view it as a civil function. It's really a civil function. And, and they it argue this really directly. Weird. And the fighting of Sinan today was based on that. I was like, no, you can't do this. This is a civil magistrate function. You can only do civil weddings. I'm not allowed to do civil weddings. <laughs> they were like, you can only. Um, and I think, because I know what brought some of this up, Jacob, was that you, you're, why don't, why don't these folks get marriage? And why are they on this process? I think that's why they don't get marriage. Because once you make it a civil legal institution, and then you say, well, these people can do it and these people can't, you do kind of just look like a bigot. Right? If it's a civil contract, and you say, well, you guys can make a civil contract, you guys can't make a civil contract. I think that's why they don't get it, because it's not a sacrament. It's yeah. not God making two people one. Yeah, in, in Israel, it's it's very complicated because um, only the chief rabbinate is, is recognized as Judaism. And the chief rabbinate will only do Orthodox weddings. Um, and so there are plenty of people who... Um, wants civil marriage in Israel and there's no you can you can get like the legal you can sign papers and get the legal documents all, yeah. yeah documents and everything so that it's like you're married but there's there's the religious marriage and then there's the in you know legal institution of civil partnership right yeah a domestic partnership and um yeah it's you know it's a difficult thing because ultimately i i think the the reason we're having these fights so i i, I don't know if you were paying attention earlier when i brought up that uh, presbyterian minister who was hiding the bibles yeah in in the legislature to protest the separation of church and state and it's like and everybody seems to only be talking about her being censured by the legislature and it's like i don't care about the legislature why isn't anybody talking about her denomination being like this isn't this isn't what an ordained minister should be doing well it's a it's a chronic problem in the way american protestantism especially functions now that and it's a problem from a protestant perspective that there's not really the capacity for church discipline Uh, you look at Luther or Calvin, they say one of the marks of the true church is that you have church discipline. Okay. If you don't have church discipline, it's not really a church, right? But if, say you're even an ordained minister, you do whatever, right? And I say, okay, that's it. You're defrocked in the Protestant world. I can't stop you from going two doors down and starting a new church. I can't stop you from calling yourself Reverend so-and-so, right? And I can't stop any of the people who used to go to the other church from following you to that, that church. I can't stop people from my church going and receiving communion from you at that church, mm. right? Like there's no, there's no capacity to, because there's no border, right? For the process, if you take the perspective, the church is just everybody who's a Christian, and Christian is harder to define in America than woman is because um, it's just anybody who identifies as one. Uh, then there's no border to it. Right? Honestly, the jurisdiction system, which is completely missing in Judaism since the advent of denominations, like there used to be that each community had its 
single rabbinic court had a rabbi that was Mara de Atra. Um, but that started falling apart um, around the advent of reform Judaism and Ju like this, this concept of a, and yeah, I, I don't know if there's a solution to that. Um, we don't really have a, um, we don't have a um, jurisdiction. Uh, you know, Chazi says the, there was a Supreme Court judge who was a Kohen who was denied marriage to a divorced woman by the Rabbanut and had to get married abroad. That's another thing that happens. So yeah. the chief rabbinate will not marry someone from the priestly caste to a divorcee. And, um, but legally in Israel, um, marriages per can be performed by anyone outside of Israel. So people go to Cyprus all the time to get married and then come back um, to, to have their marriage recognized in Israel. Yeah. Yeah. And see, we have people try to do that too. But in the Orthodox Church, we have a way of saying, no, now you're outside. Now you're excommunicated, mm. right? Now you're outside the church. You could go to some Protestant church. You could go <laughs> right, somewhere else, but, you know, and then the Protestants get mad that we say, well, you know, you're outside the church. But they're like, no, we are part of it too. There is no outside, but St. Paul sure talks like there's an outside when he says to put so-and-so out of the church, right? That that sure sounds like Honestly, it's possible. I, I, I was... I, I was very, very shocked to read the Westminster Confession and the types of things they say about Catholicism. Whoa! Oh, that's low grade. You got to read the three forms of unity for the from the Dutch Reformed Church. Well, they've uh, well, they've they've uh, <laughs> they've done revisions. Like these Westminster Confessions are still being used. Oh yeah, yeah. That son of perdition. Oh, yeah. Belgian Confession says the Pope's the Antichrist. <laughs> and it says that the, uh, the, uh, the Heidelberg Catechism says that the Papal Mass is a damnable idolatry. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Van der Klee was actually talking about that in his... Um, <laughs> it, it was talking about how they had... Um, how they had started um, re doing revisions, and the Spanish-speaking people were were like, "No, no, no, no! You can't, you can't, you can't do, remove these things about Catholics." You gotta and, leave the anti-Catholic stuff. Yeah, you have to leave the anti-Catholic stuff. And there's a channel on Inc. here in Los Angeles that my dad watches because there's lots of Hebrew music, because it's one of these really philo like over-the-top philo-Semitic Spanish, um, Spanish evangelical channels. Yeah, yeah. And my dad doesn't understand the Spanish, so he doesn't understand that, like, what at the same time that he's proclaiming his love for Israel, he's, like, talking about the demonic nature of, like, the Jesuits <laughs> and the Catholics. And, like, he's saying things that, frankly, I mean... If you were to say them in English, even in Los Angeles, the FCC would pull your license. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's honestly going back in the Netherlands to when they were religious. Now they're just not religious in the Netherlands, right? But you had two options. You had the Protestant state church and you had Roman Catholicism. And so everybody in the Protestant church, in the Reformed church, the Herod Reformed Kirk, uh, part of their identity was, I'm not Catholic. <laughs> right? Right. Part of being Reformed was being not Catholic, right? Like explicitly. Even my dad, when I told my dad I was joining the Orthodox church on the phone, he let out this long exhale. He was like, <sighs> And I was like, what? He said, I was so scared you were going to become Catholic. <laughs> right? Like, like the ants back in Michigan would have, would have, you know, 
fallen over dead to hear that if that had been the case. Um, <laughs> it's so funny to me that Michigan has become like this holy land of. of <laughs> oh yeah, CRC. Yeah. Either Grand Rapids or Holland is is the new Jerusalem, depending on if you're CRC or RCA. <laughs> it's Holland, Michigan, if you're RCA. It's Grand Rapids if you're CRC. Oh, Holland, Michigan. Okay, I thought yeah. actually yeah. Holland. Yeah. yeah. And then Zealand is sort of a DMZ between the two denominations, right? Like in between the two. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's, and they have. So every year at the big mall in, in Grand Rapids, uh, they put out the statues of St. Nicholas, who comes on Sinterklaas Day, December 6th, and Black Peter. <laughs> And Black Peter is the devil. Why is he named Peter? Mm. Because of the Pope. Oh, wow. Where does mm. Black Peter live? You're Rome. thinking hell, not hell. <laughs> Spain. Spain? Yes. Roman Catholic Spain. That's where the devil is. And so if you're good, you leave your clump and you leave your wooden shoes out on Sinterklaas. Right on, mm -hmm. on St. Nicholas Day, if you're right. a kid, and if you're good, you get a carrot. If you're bad, uh, St. Nicholas lets Black Peter have you and he puts you in a sack and takes you back to Spain where you're beaten with birch rods. Wait, isn't there it's literally a carrot and a stick in the, <laughs> in, in the office? Uh, Dwight, uh, isn't he talking about that? There's a it's a German version of it, yeah. Uh, what's his name? I can't remember the name of the. Oh, what is it? Krampus. Cramp. No, it... not the one. That's a Krampus is a version of that, but this was something else. This was a. I haven't seen The Office. I'm yeah. just going off. Of I'll Google it. Yeah. Yeah. Fairy tales. Um, so. But or, yeah, you know. so they have a big statue of Saint Nicholas and a big statue of Black Peter that they put out. In the I didn't know Spain yeah. controlled the Netherlands. Yeah, I do the know Dutch that War of yeah. Independence was against Spain. Yeah, large large numbers of uh, Jews fled to the Netherlands during the Inquisition, yeah. including the Van der Kleins, Apparently, yeah, the Netherlands was always a haven, not just for Jewish people, but for religious dissidents in general, religious minority groups in Europe, like uh, the Plymouths. <laughs> that's why the Mennonites went there. That's why the right. That's why the other Anabaptist groups went there. That's why the Puritans went there when they had to leave England. I got an answer. It's the it's the Belsnickel. Oh, Belsnickel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's their version of that. So, but um, yeah, it's it's a Dutch. It's a Dutch hive there. There's a couple others like Pella, Iowa. Redlands, when I was a kid, Redlands, California was like the really? like first Christian Reformed church was on Church Street. Really? And the Christian school, Redlands Christian School was next door. They would only hire teachers who got their teaching degrees at Calvin. Really? Yeah. And when the in the nineteen twenties there was a split where another group split off called the the PRs the Protestant Reformed, mm -hmm. they built their church and school across the street. After the church split, <laughs> so it was on the other side of the road. Like the whole time I was growing up. So until I got involved in this little corner about a year ago, I had never heard of Biola. Oh yeah, I didn't even know it existed. And when somebody told me it's Bible Institute of Los Angeles, I was like, what? <laughs> like, I thought I knew everything about Los Angeles. And there's like this whole Christian like history oh, yeah. of Los Angeles that I was completely unaware of. <laughs> Apparently, like Pentecostalism started in Los Angeles. Yeah, the Azusa Street. Yeah. 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 All kinds of, and, and you could go back to like uh, Catherine Coleman, all that kind of. Stuff. Oh yeah. So, yeah the 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 Dutch the Dutch side was more 
So there's like there was CRC. There's also an RCA church there, but people don't realize that Robert Schuler was RCA. He was Dutch Reformed. Mm -hmm. The Crystal Cathedral was a Dutch Reformed church. I thought he was CRC. No, he's RCA. RCA, okay. And uh, Norman Vincent Peale was an RCA minister in New York. Oh. And they used to refer to them as the Pope of the East and the Pope of the West, like the <laughs> Dutch Reformed circles. Which, of course, was a high insult, because remember, they're not Catholic, right? Like, that's the... I didn't realize, like, the Dutch were so influential in American Christianity. Yeah, the RCA is the for first uh, Christian denomination incorporated in the United States in the 17th century. Interesting. In the New Netherlands. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Paul was talking a lot about the various things of, like, how they're trying to figure things out. And it just seemed to me like, I was like, why are you trying to reinvent the wheel? Like, just at least, like, it's a very deliberate attempt to, to not do things the way that, like, Catholic canon law has. And, you know, traditionally, it's like, when you are that deliberate in trying not to learn from history, no wonder you end up with the woke. And and the in Orthodox Church, Mike, it, it seems like we kind of give a little bit of a nod toward the Protestant way of doing things, you know, in in America with our you know parish councils and stuff. Like that's that's not a traditional thing, is it, Father? Well, so the, the, the parish council thing was an adaptation. <clears throat> yeah. Like, how are we going to handle parish finances mm. in the U.S. economy? Right? Because, like, in Greece, it's a state church. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. like, the priests get government stipends. But oftentimes the parish yeah. councils kind of get run sort of like Protestant churches. Well, yeah. Yeah. And so that's <laughs> the problem. The problem was, well, how do they do things in America? Well, we'll give them a board of directors. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so yeah, you're right. They and tend we have, to we have the clergy the lady. I, I don't know how it's done in the Antiochian church, but in the Greek church, you know, we have the clergy, clergy lady conferences and yeah. all this stuff. And I, I just get the sense that this is sort of like a, it's an accommodation toward yeah. American way of doing things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sort of. A lot of it, like in the Antiochian archdiocese, a lot of it is show. Right. We yeah. do a lot of show votes and plebiscites, right? Like we all went to Dallas and took a vote for who was going to be the new metropolitan, right? But everybody knew the patriarch had already decided who was going to be the new metropolitan, right? But we go through <laughs> the motions of picking three candidates from whom he can but is not required to choose. And lo and behold, he makes one of the metropolitan because everybody kind of knows who he's going to pick. And so we vote for him. And then, you know, oh, look, it's the will of the people as well, right? Um, <laughs> that's... Maybe this is sort of like representing, like, in the old old days, you had the, the emperor had his say. Right. And now it's sort of like the American equivalent of that. Yeah, yeah. And just American culture, right? We won't accept things if we don't feel like we had a say in it. So, okay, we'll construct this thing to let you feel like you had a say in it. <laughs> well, I'll just go along with this. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. <laughs> like, but some people take it pretty seriously and they've got it and really think that they run the church. Yeah. Yeah. And there, so, I mean, again, I don't know how various jurisdictions handled it. Um, I know there was one church where the parish council got way out of hand years ago now in the Antiochian Archdiocese. And Bishop, Bishop Antoon showed up at their parish council meeting unannounced. <laughs> this was in another state. Mm. He flew across country without telling anyone and just appeared at the parish council meeting. That's baller. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and walked in and disbanded the parish council. Oh, man. And said, the yeah. priest is just going to run this church for the next year. We'll see how things go. And then I'll come back and we'll talk about whether you can have a parish council again. Oh, that's awesome. And then, like, left. <laughs> like, that was the whole that is so cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, so, 
That's yeah. So cool. I have seen one power move like that from a Roman Catholic bishop once. Hmm. Um, when I lived in Texas, there was the, the, the largest Catholic church in town had an attached school. And the, the woman who was the principal of the school uh, wrote to uh, the bishop and said, I really don't like this priest here. Here's all my complaints. Uh, I'm afraid that if you don't send another priest here, I'm going to not renew my contract in two years to be principal when it runs out. And the bishop sent a letter back saying, you're fired. Clear out your desk immediately. <laughs> <laughs> the priest is the acting principal of the school. Farewell. That's so cool. <laughs> That's fantastic. I'm just like, okay. <laughs> you can't quit. You're fired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <I love> it. <laughs> so, so yeah, there are some of those kind of, but at least in the Antiochian Archdiocese, if you've been around a little while, you know that a lot of it is sort of ritual behavior, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to go through this ritual of putting votes in a box so that you'll all buy into the decision that was going to be made anyway, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, Russian model. Yeah, yeah. The Russian model of democracy. <laughs> So, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of that. But oh, yeah. on a practical level, the original intent of the parish councils was to handle the finances. And that was all they were actually supposed to do. Right. So I've been, the money, count the money, pay the bills, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> you know, write the checks. I've been on our parish council for uh, 11 years now, I think. And it's overwhelmingly been a positive thing. Like we have a good parish council. I've heard so many horror stories. Yeah. Um, but it does. It's in on some level. It's like what you said. It's sort of like going through the motions of democracy or something like that. In the sense that it's when when we're having our meeting, like the majority of the work of running the church happens. It doesn't happen on parish council meetings once a month. You know, it's happening in between and the priest and the there we trust him and he's he's built up trust with us and he 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 he's working all the time about you know finding figuring out the right thing to do they come they present he presents here's what we're going to do and the parish council's like well you've done your homework it looks good to us and you know it's kind of a rubber stamp yes because the the possibility for discussion is is well I mean there's discussion but the possibility for like dissension is there and has happened in the past but you know by and large it's just like a matter of trust and you know well i mean he's the one who decides who's on the council right it's true it's true yes yeah. and <laughs> i'm guessing he's only picking people that he trusts to actually care what they say it's true he he um yeah and he's he admits that he says you know uh people because he people accuse him of that they're like well you only want people who think like you on the council and he's like yeah i only want i only want people who who take their faith seriously and <laughs> you know, yeah. see, he knows he knows what he's doing. Yeah. yeah. And one of the when I was first a priest, I was at the cathedral in in West Virginia, and I was assisting an older priest before he retired. And the most important thing I learned from him was watching him in meetings, because he could say before a meeting, "We need to do A, B, C." He would walk into the meeting, A, B, and C would happen, and everyone on the parish council would think it was their idea. And that he had nothing to do with it and hadn't even said anything about it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. he could not just run a meeting, but run a meeting, right? <laughs> like, he <Yeah>. could, <laughs> like, he's a mother in, like, the mother in uh, Big Peck Greek Wedding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, the, the funny thing with is when it, I talk to Paul Vanderclay, like, and I appreciate that he believes the the spirit works through the elder council and he's their servant. But he actually, he's like, no, like, it's I'm here to do whatever they decide. It's like, Paul, I don't like this this model of leadership you have because it honestly, it's like. It's what I call Jesus take the wheelism, right? It's like 
I'm not going to drive. I'm going to trust Jesus. And it's like, well, then yeah. what that's are you doing the, here? That's the Dutch model, though. I mean, he really is Dutch. He really is Dutch Reformed. <laughs> Dobie Vanderclay really is right a CRC pastor. It is bones. Like yeah. the they they used to have what was called the official handshake, <laughs> which was so the way it worked. The 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 pastor would come out to lead the service and preach, right? And he would be, so he would be standing in the front facing the congregation. Mm -hmm. right? And in front of him, facing the congregation, would sit the elders. And when the pastor came to take the pulpit, he would walk up and the, the president of the elders would shake his hand, signifying and trusting him, right, to, mm -hmm. to, to preach. And then he would take the pulpit and then afterwards he would descend the pulpit and go back to receive the handshake again to give approval for what he had done. And if the official handshake was not given, right. that meant it was not approved and there was trouble in River City. <laughs> and was, who's the person giving the handshake? The head of the elders. Oh. The head of the consistory. To the pastor. To the pastor. Wow. That's wild. Wow. And... Even when I was around and doing things, especially some of the really traditional churches up in, like, especially in Canada, they would still, after the service, the pastor would go into the consistory room and meet with the elders to discuss what he had said in the sermon and stuff and be sort of examined and grilled by them about it. Right? So in that system... Traditionally, the pastor was very much under the authority of the elders. The elders were the governing body of the of the congregation. That's and so interesting. That was reinforced by typically pastors got moved around every four years. They shuffled everybody around about every four years. So your elders were there all the time. They were legitimately the elders of the community who everybody knew, who were the heads of the families. Right? The five family. <laughs> Anne of Green Gables makes more sense now. Yeah. <laughs> the later books of Anne of Green Gables have like a shocking amount of Presbyterian church politics. Okay. <laughs> and that was like my only exposure to Protestants before college. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And in a lot of Presbyterian polity, the pastor is just one of the elders. It's not even a separate office. Um, but in the in the CRC, the Dutch tradition, they it is a separate office, but it's not actually over the it's actually under, and the elders can hire and fire the pastor. And this this happens sometimes in parish councils. Yeah, <laughs> <in their forest laughs> yeah, yeah. If people let it, or if you've got a weak bishop or a bishop who's not paying attention. Yes, these things happen. Yeah, yeah. So, so you guys know how. Uh, uh, Baruch Spinoza got um, got uh, excommunicated. He uh, they, so funny thing about his writ of excommunication is it wasn't issued by the rabbinic court. It was issued by the board of basically the parish board of, of his synagogue. Because they waited for, until the rabbi was out of town <laughs> and issued the excommunication under their own authority. <laughs> it's one way to do things. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, before I forget, and not directly related, uh, but this, this, a couple things that might make Jacob like Constantine more. That'll be a difficult sell. Yeah. Did you know that Constantine changed Roman law to allow Jews to serve on city councils? I did not know this. I'm not sure I approve, but okay. <laughs> That's number one. Number two, did you know, and this was later in his life, but he by edict gave synagogue leaders 
the same recusal from civil service and other benefits that Christian clergy had. Mm. So, Empire. yeah, this is this is one of the things that so rabbis, the term rabbi, um, in generally traditionally in Judaism was just a term of respect. Yeah. What happened was that in Christian countries, there was an expectation of, okay, so we have our churches, so you guys must, must have rabbis, you know, like, and so rabbinic ordination is, an, is mostly just an Ashkenazi thing. Yeah because they needed to have these types of certificates to actually function as the official functionaries for the Jewish community in those communities. And, and, and that's, that's how rabbinic ordination actually became a kind of thing. And then, um, yeah, like when denominate denominationalization started happening as a re result of the reform, the Christian Reformation, there was the Jewish Reformation, which came after and styled itself. So actually, Reform Judaism is the oldest Jewish denomination because they established themselves as a denomination yeah. before orthodoxy was formed in, in response. That's really interesting. Yeah. 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 Constantine, his edict uses the term rulers of the synagogue. <laughs> right? So it's kind of vague right? in terms of whoever's in charge over there. But yeah, I have to explain all that. Like when, when I was going through the book of Acts, I had to keep explaining to Christian people because they'd be like, well, why is the rabbi of that synagogue letting Paul talk so much? You know, it's like, <laughs> eh, that's not how it worked. <laughs> like, well, okay. I have to say this. They may um, not have had one official guy, right? Like who was in charge. Right. But but also <laughs> yeah. there is a tradition that's even true today, where if a scholar visits, he is invited to preach. Yeah. But sometimes it acts St. Paul's there for like weeks. Right. Right. In the synagogue. <laughs> you know, they're like, well, did the local rabbi want to, you know, <laughs> like well, he, 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 he does claim to have been uh, lashed to the 40 minus one. Yeah. 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 So apparently so, at least one rabbi somewhere had a problem. But yeah. Well, <laughs> you, you need to have a rabbinic court for that. Yeah. So, yeah. Once you have a rabbinic court, then that becomes a lot more official than most synagogues. Yeah. Yeah. A rabbinic court is a very different animal from a, from a, a um, just a synagogue. Yeah. Although uh, recently there's been a proliferation of people creating their own rabbinic courts. In Los Angeles, we have several people who basically just have their own rabbinic court because they want to. Yeah. Well, it's America, right? You could go put on a hat and call yourself the Bishop of Cleveland. And, you know. The Pope of Wyoming. Yeah, yeah. Oh, who was that guy? The The guy who insisted he... Oh, Pope, was it Pope Michael? The guy who, Michael, yeah. Was yeah. The, yeah. He was the right. He, I think he died recently. Actually. He did. Yeah. 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 Super random question. Um. So, early, well, in one of your earlier streams, you offhandedly mentioned like nomni sacra or whatever, right? Sacred names, abbreviations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I can. Is it that random? Because see, it's referring back to. Yeah, like like names, random would have been, hey Father Stephen, what's the leading export of Tonga? <laughs> right, and I would have said tapioca. Is it? it would have been yes, and you would have been dazzled that I knew that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I, I'm, I'm still dazzled. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would hate to play trivia against you. <laughs> yeah, um, I can see how you'd use that abbreviation for the tetragrammaton. I, I'm not sure if we have that in our tradition of the Tetragrammaton. Um, but like, 
why do we have it for, I don't know, the Theotokos and for Christ and all that other stuff? Like, Because the early scribes carried that over from Jewish practice. Okay. Was it like so, prevalent in Jew Jewish practice? Did they have it for everything or was it just for the Tetragrammaton? I don't know. Jacob might know more than me whether they did it for anything other than so a lot of times you will see L there is a uh, combination of Aleph and Lamed um, especially when you're trying to when, so when you're trying not to create shem, Shemut right uh, so in Jewish tradition um, anything that is that has Torah on it has to be buried. You can't just throw it away. That's how we ended up with the Cairo Geniza and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Um, and people are, were so strict with it. Like, the Cairo Geniza literally has people's homework and, like, yeah. random shopping lists in it, right? Oh, yeah, we do that. We do that, too. <laughs> no, there are Orthodox churches where they burn the bulletins every week that are left over. Okay. Because they have icons on them or they have scripture printed in them. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and so, um, in attempts not to create Shemut, right, um, there's a reason why we refer to Hashem a lot, right, and, um, especially theophoric names like Eliyahu, um, you will sometimes Netanyahu. see, <laughs> you will sometimes, you will sometimes see um, especially in written attempts to, like, I know, well, actually, you'll see a lot of, especially in printing, um, Hays, especially Yud Hays, like, the Hay will just be, instead of having a Hay, they would just put an apostrophe, a tick there. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that does 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 happen yeah um with with various names there are seven names that aren't that uh names that cannot be erased and then many other names which technically can't be but people also treat with reverence but all of these are names of god but then theophoric names right eliyahu whatever yeah. Um, you, you'll also get that. So. Yeah. Yeah. So the note in, in Christian texts, right, they'll abbreviate God. So it'll be Theta Sigma instead of Thos. Um, uh, or Theta Nu, depending, right, however it's conjugated. Mm -hmm. um, and the name Jesus as uh, Iota Sigma. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, the name Mary, uh, the phrase Mother of God is abbreviated. Mm -hmm. yep. Both are abbreviated. That uh, it's first letter, last letter with what looks like a tilde yep, yep, yep. over mm -hmm. it. You still see it a lot in iconography, but it's also in the earliest like New Testament texts. Yeah. Um, you know how we have the columns of like English, Arabic, Coptic. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. In your service books, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we we still do that, like. Oh, have the uh, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah for Coptic, mm -hmm. yeah. And I have to wonder if some amount of that wasn't just the fact that it used to be a lot harder, like, to get paper and get you know, abbreviating things, like Hebrew texts. Abbreviations are rather common. <laughs> Yeah. Of all types. Yeah. 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 Well, and in this case, too, we're talking about manuscripts that are in all caps with no punctuation, no spaces between words. I mean, acronyms, no. <laughs> if you don't know the acronyms that are common in a community, it can be really hard to read um, all kinds of rabbinic texts because... Um, root using acronyms, Roche Tebot, right? Um, 
it's nowadays a lot of a lot of the new texts don't use nearly as many as they used to but when you read especially the older texts like using acronyms constantly in ways that made it impossible for a lot of people to to read unless they they already basically knew what the text was talking about especially the margin notes yeah. i found in hebrew text in masura and yeah <laughs> like well i mean sort of I everything's know. abbreviated and yeah how much shorthand. how much have you seen rabbinic responsa have you only only a little uh, honestly i think well, first of all, I mean, I have to say when I read 4QMMT, like I was, I was really flabbergasted because it really, really reads like a response. Like I, I, <laughs> I was talking to Yosef about it. And I said, I could see this being printed today as a response. <laughs> right. If, I mean, in a sense, obviously the, the, the matter and the, you know, but re rabbinic responsa texts are, um, I, I have to wonder, like, if Christians would not read the epistles and possibly even the gospels differently if they were not fam more familiar with responsa as a manner of of writing so what's a responsa oh so what thank you what, what was <laughs> what was almost always a i mean this this was a common thing and actually paul kind of alludes to it so one of the ways you proved you were actually a rabbi and a scribe was be, being able to write, right? And so, um, first of all, people still to this day will use what is called a teuda, which is a um, um, certificate, right? And Paul actually mentions some people had certificates as oh, we're being sent by a rabbi, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I believe, um, I mean, I believe the Catholic Church still uses like letters of good standing and that type of stuff, which... Yeah, we do too. Right. Yeah. Like which if I wanted to go to Mount Athos, I need a letter from my bishop saying... Right. So it's, so these types of things were, were common. Right. And even like letters of credit and whatever. Right. But what would often happen is that people would, when they had a question, they would ask a rabbi and he would issue a responsum. Uh, responsa is plural of responsum, a teshuva. And he would basically explain his reasoning for whatever edict he what what whatever his answer was right so uh, to give an example right there was a big question in the united states whether or not um we needed to worry about whether um the milk we buy is cow's milk or not because hundreds of years ago if you didn't know it was cow's milk, it was possible that like horse milk or pig milk or any other milk was, was, um, had adulterated it. And there is a rabbinic edict since the time of the Talmud that, um, in or like in order to know that some, that milk is kosher, you have to have a kosher witness. You have to have, a Jew who says, yes, I saw this as milk from a cow, right? And obviously that's very, very difficult if, and if not impractical here in the United States, at least it was more impractical years ago. Um, and so 
this was a real question. And Rabbi Moses Feinstein, Moshe Feinstein, who was considered one of the greatest rabbis in the United States, issued a response on where he said that we can rely on the fact that in the United States it is illegal and there are USDA, um, what you call it, there are USDA checks and whatever. And frankly, not everybody follows this. The Rebbe actually very much was kind of opposed to following it unless you needed to. Um, and recommended not following that. And today it's actually become a lot easier to get what's called Chalab Israel, which is because with video cameras, you can actually <laughs> make it a lot easier to make sure that it's actually cow's milk um, yourself and not rely on the USDA. But this responsum, like, it was, it was really the force of Rav Moshe explaining what his reasoning was and why and right so responsa have for thousands of years been um a way in which jewish law gets explained and promulgated um and i was very very shocked to see for qmmt which is one of the dead sea scrolls was basically a responsa that's basically like how it was structured and um because i mean we only have we have responsa all the way from like maimonides and some of the geonim like from 12 1300 years ago i believe that's as far back as they go but um yeah i, I mean to see for qmmt was written in the same structure was just very surprising and to some extent like i don't know how how much the epistles of paul might have similarly followed yeah. first corinthians is is awful close to that so the way first corinthians is organized is saint paul sort of goes through a bunch of topics and he introduces each topic the same way. It's peri in Greek, which means basically concerning. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. That's how it's usually translated. So we'll say concerning marriage, concerning uh, food offered to idols, concerning. Mm -hmm. And he sort of gives his opinion and then gives the argument right here. And here's why. Right. And then sort of reiterates, therefore, this now concerning next topic. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. And he sort of goes through. So, First Corinthians is probably the best example of that in in Saint Paul's epistles, mm -hmm. in terms of structurally. Yeah, um, like Romans is more of a protracted argument. Um, oh, I mean, <laughs> the funny thing is, different response. I like you learn the character of different rabbis, like, and some rabbis, Rav Avadio Yosef, for example, he, he died like 10 years ago. Um, he, he actually, he had two collections of responsa, one which was shorter, brief ones that were meant to be for people who weren't really scholars, just explaining simple things, and then the in-depth ones. Um, so, he was, Yabi Omer was known that, like, he gained his fame because he had this incredible photographic memory and he would, um, he would just recite basically every other rabbinic authority that, like, we're talking libraries full of stuff. He would, like, cite everyone who discusses an issue. So people yeah. who didn't really like Ramavadya himself very much or agree with him were forced to buy his <laughs> response <laughs> because it was like an index. And when uh, Bar Ilan University, was, which is the religious university in Israel, um, came out with a search engine for rabbinic responsa, they would use his responsa as a way of checking to see if 
if the search was actually doing well or not. Um, so there, I mean, we have we have responsa from Maimonides, from uh, I think Rashi as well. Um, and different rabbis write in different ways, but there's, there is a certain cadence to them of, okay, this is the question, this are the issues, this is why, and this is my ruling. Is in tight. <laughs> so another problematic question, um, I quite like the idea of the tetragrammaton. Um, <laughs> in, in general? general. Like yeah. It. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, the ineffable be... nature of the te tetragrammaton. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it might be the Neoplatonist in me. Um, but I don't know. If I bring that up at church, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get a lot of weird looks. Um, is that something like slightly amenable? To the tradition or i i i mean if you're talking about the coptic coptic tradition i'm the wrong guy <laughs> yeah, yeah. I um the so typically in greek it was translated mm -hmm. with the participle so it's o on mm -hmm. and but it still have the abbreviation well it's only three letters so mm -hmm. <laughs> that's um and and so o is the article mm -hmm. and then it's so it's omicron omega uh new and that's i think they're using the greek participle again to try to get at the hyphial third masculine singular but saint gregory palamas directly says that own that name is one of the divine energies. Okay. Now he's he's post Chalcedon, so you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, <laughs> but in general, in in general, that's the which is that the the orthodox approach has been that the the divine names are activities. Yeah, and you've of mentioned God in the world, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and you've mentioned don't, yeah, don't refer to his essence there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've mentioned Saint Dionysius on this. Yeah, and um, I yeah, somewhat that's pre Chalcedon, maybe. Yes, maybe, <laughs> maybe. And, what is? Yeah. Do you know? Do you know if the Coptic Church accepts? We don't have we don't ask his intercessions at all. I mean, okay. I yeah, I've I've never okay. heard of him in Coptic circles. So, which is ironic because yeah. scholars all think he emerged somewhere in, in Syriac yeah. Orthodoxy, non Chalcedonian yeah. Syriac Orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Shows yeah. what they know. Chat GPT apparently created a Greek and Coptic Orthodox saint just for me. <laughs> Because I, I was I was researching, I was using Chat GPT to like uh, mm -hmm. tr try to help Andrew find a patron saint, mm -hmm. and I'm like asking Chat GPT all these questions, and finally it comes up with like the saints, which like he he was from Jerusalem and then went to Ireland. <laughs> he seemed like a great saint. I'm like, well, where's the saint from? And like it gives me a bunch of books. And I had, and I went and I'm like looking at the books and it's like, I can't find this thing. <laughs> yeah. Do you hear about that lawyer who got wrecked doing that? Mm -hmm. Apparently he asked chat GPT to find legal precedents mm -hmm. and a bunch of them were fake. <sighs> and so then the judge called him up and said, so do you look up and actually read precedents before you submit them to the court and he's like oh of course i do your honor he's like oh so you 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 go and you look these you read these it turned out like half of them were fake like half of them were yeah, you can get you can get into serious yeah. trouble <laughs> because the one thing judges well judges actually will get 
upset if you misstate a precedent. Yeah. Like, if you misrepresent it, they will get upset at you. Let alone but, like but did fake ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. ChatGPT is really good at making stuff up, like giving you an answer that sounds right. Like I've tried it in engineering stuff, and it it's like it can kind of point you in the general direction as to where to look for the right answer, but you have to fact check everything it says. I I you, do have to say, someone asked it to give them my view of original sin, and it was actually pretty accurate. Oh. So next time you don't show up, I'll just bring up Chad GP. Yeah, I just asked it. What does Father Stephen DeYoung say? <laughs> we'll just carry on for four hours yeah. that way. I feel like if you're asking it about a certain, like, like the more specific you get, the better it's probably going to be. No, actually, um, it's the other way around. From from my experience, the more specific you get, the more bullshit the answer is. Interesting. Because it's a large language model. Um. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking if it didn't have like as many stuff, as many things to pull from. Well, if it like, has fewer things to pull from, it's more likely to be BS. Try because, to fill in the blanks. Yeah, yeah, all it's trying to do is guess what you're trying to understand okay. on a word by word basis. I, I'm right? gonna pull up. I'm gonna pull up my my Twitter. Uh, this tweet. I, I tweeted earlier today. This is oh, Martin yeah. Luther's fault. Yeah. They actually mm. had a church service by Chat GPT and it was at a Lutheran church. What kind of Lutheran church was this? This was actually in Germany. Yeah, it's some okay. European. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was actually so 300 people who had shown up on Friday morning for an experimental Lutheran church service. Almost entirely generated by AI. No Dear friend, do that. it is an honor for me to stand here and preach to you. Oh, I'm not showing you guys what I'm reading. Sorry. Uh, dear friends, it is an honor for me to stand here and preach to you as the first artificial intelligence at this year's of Convention of Protestants in Germany. The avatar said with an expressionless face and monotonous. <laughs> I have to say though, if you've seen the other video, uh, one of their presiding bishops got up and gave a speech about how God is queer. So I might choose the AI, I might choose the AI, like out of the available options at that meeting. Like, yeah. fraud says, "Lord have mercy." What more can you say? <laughs> All right, I gotta stop hanging out with West Coast people. It's bad for my sleep schedule. The uh, yeah, somebody somebody posted somewhere. They're like, yeah. So apparently now humans are gonna do all the menial manual labor, and AI is gonna write poetry and plays. Like this is not the future I signed up for. Like, this is the opposite <laughs> of the deal for giving the <laughs> robots the their around. jobs. Yeah. But I like my, my take on the whole AI thing is uh, they're all trying to panic us because for the first time, jobs held by the professional managerial class are going to get automated. When regular working people's jobs get automated out of existence, nobody cares. But now that it's like screenwriters and, you know, greeting card writers and all of these people with comfortable middle class <laughs> lifestyles. Now it's Skynet, right? We uh, have to destroy the, all the technology. Okay, I, I don't know why, like my Twitter feed has become the things we're talking about. But Mark Zuckerberg credits Elon Musk with kicking off the tech trend of firing middle managers. Yeah. <laughs> That's... So apparently, like. Ever since he cut two thirds of the staff of Twitter and nobody noticed, <laughs> every... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. everybody else in tech is like, hmm, maybe we could fire some people. <laughs> Which is great, honestly. Yeah. But uh, yeah. All right. Okay. I gotta head off. This has been fun. Thank you, Emma. Good seeing you.
Good to see you. Good to meet Good you, to meet you. Um, Father Stephen. So speak of robots, I had to mute there because Rosie, our new <laughs> robotic vacuum cleaner, <laughs> was emptying herself. Ah, that's what it was. I see. Yes. Speaking of AI, yeah. yeah. Um, I I wanted to um, my run by you my thought on the uh, the sex negativity positivity thing that was going around. I don't know if you're aware of that, Father Stan. I heard you guys talking about it briefly. Yeah, yeah. Um, you guys brought it into the marriage conversation, which is right. But also, um, but when I was listening to Sam and what's her name and Paul, um, Laura, uh, Laura, excuse me, I keep forgetting your name. Um, <clears throat> they they were really focused on specifically the act of sex and whether that's a positive or negative thing. Yeah. And yeah, they got um, St. Augustine back at the back of their head. <laughs> yes. They, he came up and they're like, <laughs> Oh yes. And he's one of the, and yeah. So, I mean, and, and my, what I kept thinking during that conversation was like, okay, sex. I'm, we're not talking about marriage. Right. We're just talking about that. And, um, and it was just, it's like, you know, what if you were to ask the same question about any act that we do as human beings, you know, is it a positive or negative thing? And it, like, for example, eating meat, let's just say, <laughs> take for example, eating meat, you know, what's the highest possible example of some of a Christian life in terms of eating meat, you know, and you, if you look at ascetic writings or monastic writings, for sure, like, you know, the highest, the highest, um, ideal is a vegetarian right a, a, a monastic is, mostly yeah right i mean and and it's but but then nobody would say that oh you're sinful because you ate meat but at the same time it's like that's an ascetic practice that you could you could by giving that up or by by going beyond that or putting aside any passion you get closer you can come become closer to god and it applies to any passion or anything it's like okay you put put sex in its right rightful place in terms of the hierarchy of things that are important. And that's not negativity. I, I, I didn't know, know where he get, got the term sex negativity from, you know? Well, so, yeah. And you notice we bring this up after Roman Catholic Emma leaves. So now we're all <laughs> safe to uh, critique <laughs> Roman Catholic views of sexuality. Um, yeah. So, I mean, uh, St. Augustine has the idea, and it's based on his past, right? Because he's a human. And that was his problem. That was what he struggled against his whole life. And Jerome as well. They brought up Jer Jerome yeah. as a big part of this too. Yeah. St. Jerome Saint Jerome said that uh, whenever he started struggling with lustful thoughts, he would go and study Hebrew. <laughs> At least they didn't bring up Peter <laughs> Damien. <laughs> because... Because Hebrew was really hard for him, and so it required all of his focus, right? Like, it's like doing push-ups or something. Yeah, so that's why he, he learned so much Hebrew. I yeah. see. <laughs> there was there was another saint I don't remember who who used to throw himself in a thorn bush every time he had lustful thoughts. I don't recommend that one to people. All right, how about uh, Peter uh, Peter Damien? Um, <laughs> his comments on the uh, the married clergy and or the the wives oh. of priests who are. Uh, whores and yeah, oh yeah 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 so yeah so um he really has the idea that it's always sinful always and that's sort of mitigated by pregnancy <laughs> right? um and that's at the core of western thought on sexuality and you compare that with like St. John Chrysostom at roughly the same time who says, no, sex within marriage has two purposes. Number one, reproduction, <laughs> right? Making babies. And number two, the, the physical bond of husband and wife. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I remember uh, in that order, right? Yeah. yeah. As part of our like marriage uh, counseling before I got married, um, our priest assigned us some readings from St. John. And um, I remember distinctly one of his sermons, he, you, you could almost picture yourself there. He's talking about the beauty of marriage and conjugal relations. And he's 
getting kind of graphic about it. And then he stops. He's like, I can see I've embarrassed most of you. And maybe I'll move on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is, this is from very early on between East and West. This is a point of struggle, right? Because the canons of the Quintessex Council forbid the requirement that clergy be celibate. And that's why Rome, who accepted them at first, then didn't anymore. <laughs> um, and there's an apostolic canon that says that anyone who on a feast day refuses to eat meat, drink alcohol, or have sex with their wife is anathema, is excommunicated <laughs> right out of the church because they have blasphemed God's creation by saying that those things are evil. Right. So the Eastern Christian tradition is very clear on this. The Western Christian tradition kind of diverges, diverges on this. And so then this gets related to how we view celibacy at all. Right. So we have monks who are celibate in the Orthodox Church, but we don't view it as, oh, this is the higher calling. If you're just not up to it, okay, you can get married, right? <laughs> but these are the people who are really doing Christianity right are the ones who are celibate, right? Um, and celibacy makes them holier or makes them more pure, right? Um, in, in the East, it's there are certain individuals who have this special calling. Everybody else should get married, <laughs> right? And, and make babies if they can, right? Like, unless you're one of these special people, right? And that's even true of the nuances of asceticism in the East, hmm. right? Like St. Simeon Stylites, who lived for years on top of a pillar, you are not called to do that, right? It's not like, well, if I really want to be holy, I have to go live on top of a pillar, hmm. right? <laughs> this is a particular, it's that prophetic, right, enactment thing, right, that, that we were mentioning <clears throat> earlier right? Like Ezekiel walking around naked or cooking over excrement or right, because God tells him to do it. That's not something everyone is called to do, right? In fact, it's something most people are forbidden to do. <laughs> um, and so it's the same kind of thing. And so if you're a monastic, you're a particular person who God has called to this particular way of life in a particular place at a particular time for a particular reason in service of the community as a whole, right? And unless you're that particular special person, you get married and have kids. So the second piece is how we look at asceticism, right? So asceticism in the East is not giving up bad things. You're supposed to give up sin always, right? Like that's not asceticism, right? <laughs> like not sinning is what you're supposed to do. Asceticism is for a time, right, and in a particular period, giving up something good for something better. So like during Lent, for this period of time, I'm going to give up enjoying the rich foods I enjoy and filling my belly, and I'm going to give up uh, spending money on things I don't need, right? And I'm going to give up these things so that I can give that money to the poor. So that I could use the time I would spend cooking focused on prayer. Right? So that for this period of time, I can pursue these things that are higher than the things I'm giving up. But then after that time's over, right? You know, and Lent ends, Pascha comes, and we have the huge feast where we eat all those things we've given up, <laughs> right? Yeah, and we give yeah. up. And that doesn't mean we stop praying, right? But mm -hmm. we have a time where we focus. And there was another thing that was, and thanks for clarifying that. There was, there was some other, another thing that was said um, that, oh man, shoot, it just dropped. I, I just forgot it. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, the one thing I will say is um, in Judaism, we take it very seriously that a Nazarite brings a sin offering at the end of his Nazarite vow. Because to become a Nazarite is for the purpose of um, greater sanctification. But it's actually a 
falling from the ideal. And um, so it's funny, but like, so Tevilat Ezra, right? So um, according to Jewish tradition, Ezra um, made an edict that after relations, you have to go to the mikvah. You have to um, go to the mikvah, go, be baptized, go to the ritual baths, um, even though it doesn't itself from Torah law cause necessarily uh, ritual impurity. Um, because there are there is this concept of in Judaism of Yerida Tzorach Aliyah of, of descent for the purpose of ascent, right? In, a, in the way that you might cry, crouch down in order to jump further up, right? There is this idea of going into Tumah, going into impurity in order to have a greater sense of purity itself, right? So, and this is really important to understand in relation to, for example, the menstrual cycle, right? Because there is a concept a lot of people have is an understanding of, oh, well, a menstruant woman is impure, is tame, therefore she is sinful. And that's not correct. That's not, there, there is a time for separation between husband and wife, but ultimately we very much believe that the image of God is ma masculine and feminine together. And that's why when husband and wife are together, they, they do that which is most holy, which is create an actual other human being, right? Like you don't, you don't be, you cannot be more godly than to create another human being as a human being, right? And hopefully anyone who holds one of their children in their hands recognizes that that is the greatest fruit of cre of being representing God in the world, right? And so, yes, having children is the apogee of, of creation and being a human being. Um, at the same time, um, there is this concept that in order for that to happen, there is, a, a, there is some impurity which attaches to us as human beings. And so this is why when we started talking about this stuff, I said, um, sex positivity and sex ne negativity is the wrong way of looking at it. And I mean, even myself, like I, I, I think my understanding was so ensconced in this Protestant view of sex, um, which is very, very different from the biblical view that I, I didn't quite comprehend the, the Jewish um, position, the biblical, what I would call the biblical position, as well as I hope I do now, which is separation, reunification, separation, reunification, separation, reunification, um, not to be too graphic, is in fact the Ratzo Veshov is the It is, so let me pull up the psalm. Um, uh, 
Halakh ya Allahu Akbar. On this stream, don't you have to pull it up in Greek? Um, Affirmative. <laughs> I, I I wouldn't even know how to. So one <laughs> Psalm one twenty six. Um, let me pull. And just because you said that, I am going to pull it up in Hebrew. Uh, what what Psalm did I say? One twenty six. Yes. One twenty six. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is a psalm that many Jews have um, memorized. Uh, pull it up uh, because it is it is um, recited before the grace after meals, um, and there are many beautiful songs about it, right? Uh, but Verse six: Halach yelach uvacho no se nesha hazara bo yavo verina no se alumotab. He he goes back and forth crying during the time of the planting. He shall surely come back with hope, with joy, carrying his um, his sheaves. And frankly, I don't really know if it's possible to translate the Hebrew, um, but there is a very real sense in which this encompasses what it is to be human. It talks about the story of Adam and Eve in, um, in Genesis, and it is a metaphor for marriage and marital relations. And this is the 18th Kathisma. The It's read during the um, pre-sanctified liturgies during Lent every week. Yeah. Beautiful. There's certain one, yeah, that's one that's just, I think it's the ones that get repeated the most. Those are the ones that, that hit me the hardest because I know them best. Well, that's that's the whole point of liturgy. That's that's something that, like honestly, like you. So, the Amida, the great standing prayer, right, is recited at least three times a day. Gen if you go to services, you hear it five times a day because it gets repeated at least twice. So. Five times a day, six days a week, for 10 years, I heard that. And to this day, like, when I say it, it has fresh insight to me. Because that's what good liturgy does. It's, it has a depth to it that... Yes, you repeat it over and over and over again. Like there are, you know, Chazi, he actually, he says he recites the Amidah in, in English sometimes just to slow himself down because he's said it three times a day, every day since he was a child, right? And like to some extent, it's, it's just so ingrained in you. Right? Like, but if it's good liturgy, it speaks to you every single time. And that's the amazing thing about Psalms. And I have to say, there are no translations which can do the Hebrew justice. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, no, because there's there's too many features of Hebrew poetry that don't work in other languages. Just all the puns. I remember, I, I mean, it happens to me all the time. I say to uh, somebody, the Hebrew is, uh, I, I say the Bible is filled with puns. And they're like, they either think I'm being sarcastic or I'm joking or they're like shocked. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's chock full of puns. Yeah. 
And you, you get somebody who's like very serious about their Bible. <laughs> and they, they, they like, some, some people kind of get offended at it. Like the idea, what? There are, oh, there yeah. are puns in the Bible? Oh, no, no, no. I'm talking funny puns, like really funny yeah. puns in the Bible. And you just can't translate that. I'm sorry. How do you translate a pun from one language to another? Yeah. When when a pun gets explained, it's not as funny. Yeah. Yeah. And uh... <laughs> so. <laughs> and so the thing with Semitic languages is every like the words are all based on three letter um, roots, and. One of the things that kills me about Strong's, um, one of the reasons, so there's one guy who watches my channel who has written a new, um, like, type of Bible dictionary himself, which is, it lists things by the roots, just like by the roots. Like, if this is the root, I don't care, like, three letter root, right? And um, with Strong's, like even even things that clearly have the same root, he will he will separate them into right. different different numbers, and um, it's all Father Stephen's fault. I had things to do, <laughs> I was, but what can I do? Um, and so. I mean, there are only 22 letters in Hebrew. There's a lot of things which sound alike, different roots. Six and... of the letters are roughly... <laughs> <laughs> different shades of that, yeah. <laughs> um, and so making puns is really, really easy. Right. And that's why Hebrew poetry is alliteration. And the first time I was teaching someone how to read, like Genesis one is a common place to teach people how to read. Well, the letter, letter Gimel doesn't show up in Genesis one until like the 10th verse, because it's just so alliterative. Right. It's just using the same sounds over and over and over again, right? Um, it, Tohu wabohu. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just like the letter Gimel literally, I think, only gets used like a, a few times an entire chapter, right? Um, because it's 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 like an extraneous sound, right? And so th there's a reason why I have never met a Jew who has said they can't believe in Judaism because of Genesis 1. Like, I am not saying that I, a lot of them are, you know, have heretical views of Gen Genesis 1. They don't believe in creation. They don't whatever. But none of them ever point to Genesis 1 and say, yeah, because this, um, um, good night, Sherry. Um, um, a lot of them, well, but it's just such an obviously poetic text that it's fine. You want to take it figuratively, take it figuratively. Don't let it destroy your entire faith. But when you're reading it in translation, it's lost all of its poetry, right? And then you have a fundamentalist, modernist reading on top of that. Yeah. And so Mayim and Shemayim. I, I remember in college, one of my roommates was like, the Bible talks about the waters above the heavens. I can't believe it. It's like, no, no, no. 
but Mayim and Shamayim, like they rhyme. <laughs> like talking about Mayim, Tachat, and Shamayim, right? They're, they're, like, like it's like uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't even you know talking about roses are red and violets are blue, and you violets aren't blue; they're violet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The only English translation of the Torah that I've ever seen even make a good attempt at preserving the poetry is the one Shaken did years ago. I don't know if you've ever seen it. You know, are you familiar with Shaken as a publisher at all? I am not. Okay. They're, I'm sure they're, I mean, I know they're not Orthodox Jewish, but they're a, they're a publishing house that deliberately does Jewish literature. Okay. So they did like the complete works of Franz Kafka Okay. Right. So it's not, it's not just strictly religious, but it's just yeah. They're obviously not orthodox. Right. Right. Yeah. They're obviously not orthodox, but it's just about like yeah. Jewish literature, culture. Okay. Right. Yeah. But so they published a. It's called the Five Books of Moses, a translation of the Torah. Okay. In English. Hmm. And they at least tried. Right. So like Genesis one and most of the Torah actually is the way the Psalms are in most English Bibles. Right. They tried to get the meter. They tried to get the <laughs> right yeah. the poetic element, and you can't in English, right? Ultimately, right. But they at least took a swing at it, right. <laughs> right? like trying to. Have Have you looked at Tabor's translation of Genesis? James Tabor introduced one recently. I it was so cheap. I want. I almost bought it just to support him. It was like five bucks or something, but. Um, I heard him discussing it, and what he's done is he he has attempted to use the same word every time the same root is used in Hebrew in order to maintain all the references. To try to references. help you pull it together, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and to some extent, I mean, it, it is wooden and stuff because, yeah. because you have to be in that. But um, I think he went so far as, like, for Nahash, um, he uh, and Nehoshet, bronze and, and serpent, using shining for both. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. like any time it was the same route, he tried to keep one. Mm. Yeah. Um, which... Yeah. Like obviously, it's not it's not a way of reading the Bible. No, it'd be helpful if you're if you don't have the Hebrew and yeah, yeah, you're yeah. trying to figure certain things out. Yeah. Good night, guys. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. The uh, yeah, it's hard. I think Robert Alter did did a good job with the Psalms, but. I don't know. A lot of the rest of his Old Testament translation is kind of mon mundane. Mm. Like I didn't find it to be like at, at, like when he's doing the in the Psalms, even some of Proverbs and some other wisdom literature stuff in Job is pretty decent. Um, but uh, I mean, it's not that it was bad, but I mean, like his translation of First Samuel is like there's nothing like super revelatory or interesting about it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's, it's, for Samuel, you know. Um. Yeah. So with me, I found I have a much harder time dealing with people who are Orthodox and, well, I mean, he's, he is Orthodox. I mean, he goes to an Orthodox synagogue, but like, it's, there's just, there's something that I have a harder time with. Like, I have a harder time referring to conservative rabbis as rabbis than I do referring to a, you as a father, right? It's like, Father Stephen, that's fine. But Rabbi David Wolfe, I'm sorry, that just can't come out of my mouth. Um, and there's, there's a sort of certain similarity, like... A, I, I have actually been definitely working on that, becoming more tolerant. But like, 
it's it's when it's when they're so close that it just grates on me so much. Yeah, when they get when they they go sideways. Yeah. I so I, yesterday there's a um, Orthodox Jewish channel demystifying um, Judaism. And they're literally trying to do exactly the opposite of the Lords of Spirits podcast. <laughs> Demythologize everything? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Modern Orthodox, right? They're like, yeah, we, but we're rationalists. And yeah. we're like... <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> like, the, so the disregard, point. right? Like... <laughs> well, okay... <laughs> so yeah yeah okay so there are plenty of and, and this is where all of atheist judaism comes from is there are people who are culturally jewish who love jewish culture but they hate anything that's supernatural and i, I on yeah. on discord i i called them fish who hate water right yeah they're like they love their life, but like this water stuff is just like pushing them around and like yeah. get it, like slowing them down. And if they didn't have to worry about water, like air seems so much better to them than water. Like, let's get rid of all the water. Yeah. Liberal Protestants are the same way. Yeah. Like, I mean, I had a. There was there was uh, when we were at, when we were at Saint Tikhon's seminary, part of the field work in one of the local prisons was supervised by a guy who was a mainline Protestant minister and a prison chaplain who could kind of get us in and you know set up the stuff. And somebody at one point, whatever discussion, mentioned I think the word demon. We got this big lecture about how he doesn't believe in ghouls and goblins and ghosts and blah, 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 blah. And we're kind of like, how about God? Do you, like, do you believe in... <laughs> like, you know? Yeah. No, Yosef, I mean, yeah. in that discussion, Yosef was like, there are a lot of people who are trying to be like, there's no such things as demons. And it's like, if there's no such thing as demons, then, like... I, well, like there's no good and evil there's no there's no like there's no supernatural it's it's funny but dennis prager may be like the most he he doesn't call himself orthodox because he is he is actually non-denominational jewish in the fact that like he has his own thing like <laughs> and he's very rationalist yeah very very rationalist right yeah. And it's funny, but like he he may be even more Protestant than I am, and I like to call myself the most Protestant Jew you you will ever meet. Um, but yeah, no, there's and this is one of the re, one of the several reasons I I was never able to take modern orthodoxy seriously. It it would have been a lot easier to to ensconce myself in in modern orthodox judaism as opposed to haredi or hasidic judaism but i the enchanted world of hasidism there's a reason why hasidic like H hasidism has completely almost completely consumed judaism over the past 300 years and it's it's I have to say, I think it's a it's a working of of the spirit. It's a working of God. Yeah. Well, I mean, you see a similar move in Christianity of people moving. I mean, those liberal Protestant denominations are all dying. A quick death, not even a slow death anymore. And people going back to more and more traditional forms of Christian worship and practice and belief and if you had told me 20 years ago that Hebrew Union College, so Hebrew Union College had four campuses. It's the Reform Seminary. They, they shut down two or three of them over COVID. Um, Jewish Theological Seminary had a Los Angeles campus. They shut that down and sold it over. Like, they can't find enough 
enough people who want to be uh, reform and conservative rabbis anymore. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've never understood, like, uh, same thing with liberal Protestantism, right? And Unitarian Universalists even more so. Like, <laughs> half of them are atheists, right? So it's like, sleep in on Sunday, watch football in your underwear, man. Like, why are you getting up and going to church? Like, what? Well, we have Sunday <laughs> Assembly in Los Angeles. Okay. <laughs> Sunday assembly, they're they are avowed atheists. Yeah. They they get together on Sunday morning, sing songs to atheism and, and hear a uh, atheist sermon. Yeah. It's, it's like you're the most Protestant atheist. But no. <laughs> <laughs> like just acting on pure ideology. Can you imagine what Nietzsche would say if he saw them doing that? <laughs> like how loathsome he would find that. Like but yeah, the the but then trying to find somebody who wants to lead one of those communities. You know, like, so what's typical in the, in the liberal Christian context, at least in my experience, is that a lot of the people who are leaders in those uh, churches are people who wanted to be leaders in more traditional and conservative churches, but they wouldn't have them. So the like the Unitarian Universalist Church in West Virginia was co-pastored by a couple that was an interracial couple that got married in the early 70s in West Virginia. Okay. They weren't going to be accepted right. in your run-of-the-mill mm -hmm. <laughs> right, conservative Protestant church in West Virginia. And so they moved to a church where they would be accepted. Right. And and that's why you have such a high percentage of female clergy in those denominations. Right. That's why they move to the, you know, Cons the 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 conservative rabbinates may be almost exclusively filled today with women who would be Orthodox Jews if they could be ordained within Orthodox Judaism. Yeah. And for a very long time, large numbers of conservative synagogues, and to some extent even today, conservative synagogues are, uh, their rabbis are orthodox people who take positions in conservative synagogues. Because conservative synagogues have so much more money than, and the funny thing is, like, my family, almost all of my family call themselves conservative Jews. They have no effing clue what conservative Judaism actually believes in. Right? Yeah. So they, David Wolpe, when he started doing gay marriages, what, like, it's still a sore point at Sinai Temple where he announced he was leaving last year. Um, he still hasn't left. But the vast majority of of people like who go to the synagogue are like, hold on, you 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 believe in gay marriage now? Like, what happened? Like, and reform. <laughs> so, I was at a reform synagogue. Uh, I I now belong to the reform synagogue. I was at a reform synagogue. I belong to. The things this little corner has done to me. Um, and I was explaining to some of the congregants, like we were talking and I was talking about, I was explaining to them classic reform. Now, there is a splintering group of, I don't even know what you call them. You, you could say they're like reactionaries, but they're splintering from reform because they don't like the fact reform is using so much Hebrew and um, has now kind of become completely overtaken with Zionism. And um, a lot of their um, synagogues will have kosher or um, kosher style food, right? So it used to be like the first graduating class of HUC, they served frog's legs. 
they served frog's legs at the first graduating class of the rabbinic, right? And like no Hebrew, right? English. Um, and the 1868, I think, the Pittsburgh platform was like, we do not look forward to a return. We do not return to Palestine. We, it, it references the God idea. This is 1868. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, that's like German liberal Christian level of <laughs> like apostasy already. Yeah. Well, that's that's where reform came from. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And Former so Russia, yeah. Yeah. So so the classic, so classic, and they're like, we don't see ourselves as a nation. We don't look for and that's why they're called temples, right? Yeah. They, that's why reform called themselves temples not synagogues yeah and so i was explaining this classic reform like they don't speak hebrew they don't believe in israel uh, the state of israel as a jewish nation they don't believe in even kosher style keeping kosher and <laughs> yeah. and this this elderly woman who had been going to a reform synagogue her entire life right? Cradle reform says to me, I quote, so what makes them Jewish? <laughs> and I was like, good question. But there, there is a categorical difference between the people in the pews of reform and conservative synagogues and the people who actually run them yeah. and the actual theology of those. And generally the people who go to reform and conservative, like as far as they understand it, Oh, Judaism is Orthodox Judaism, but I'm not that religious. Um, there are reform synagogues, which do not have uh, circumcision. I, I I definitely believe that on the West Coast. So West Coast is very different from East Coast. Yeah. So yeah. reform, reform, like conservative on the West Coast, on the East Coast is is almost like Orthodox on the West Coast. Yeah. There are Orthodox synagogues in Los Angeles that that to some extent mirror what some ref some conservative synagogues are like. Um, there are conservative synagogues on the West, uh, on the East coast, which have separate seating, which would never happen on the West, the West coast. Yeah. Um, and the separate seating, like, isn't very strongly enforced in in some orthodoxish synagogues in Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Well, I'm specifically thinking the West Coast because uh, the most pushback I've ever gotten on a post mm. was uh, I did a blog post once talking about circumcision and where St. Paul talks about, you know, all been circumcised with Christ's circumcision. And despite it having nothing to do with the blog posts, several of these like anti circumcision advocate intactivists, middle aged yeah. white women, yeah, like went crazy all over social media, like any place where anybody reposted a link to the blog. And I'm okay, like, what calm down. Like so, <laughs> so there's, there's something you have to understand about the intactivists there is a very highly funded campaign against circumcision that has hired uh, public relations firms to make circumcision on the internet sound like the most horrible thing you could possibly do to your child. Um, and their tactics are absolutely wild to the point where they have set up supposedly pro-circumcision websites or circumcision neutral websites 
so that Wikipedia would cite them as, and like the Wikipedia articles on circumcision, there it's, I, I worked, I, I got my bachelor's degree in public relations and I worked in public relations for a few years. And so I see the tactics. It's, it's, there is, the intactivists are highly astroturfed. There are very, very well-funded anti-circumcision campaigns, which is bizarre to me. But some of these intactivists, like, it's just become such a passion for them. It's, like, become their religious thing where... It is a, it, it's become a religious passion. And so what you see on the internet, like I almost, I, I have, I have a cousin who's very, very liberal. He, um, he works for ProPublica, right? And I kind of like, with all the things, I kind of expected he might not have a circumcision for his son. It's like, and no, he, he, he did. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, way too on i am so online that i think this is this has infected places that it really hasn't yeah there was there was a there was a peak liberal moment on the synod stream today it was sort of an exemplification of uh someone praying nearly in tears apologizing for the fact that everyone sitting at the head table was a white male and I said, I said, notice, right? This is the key thing. Notice he's not resigning to have someone more diverse replace him. Of course not. He's not asking that they reconstitute the people at the head table to fix the problem. He's just feeling really horrible about it performatively. Right? <laughs> like, I'm like, that is that is the key to the liberal mindset right there this is my textbook for my class diversity oppression and change oh boy oxford university press do you know how much i had to pay for this <laughs> too much i guarantee that I, I i bought it secondhand but it's i i think it's like 80 bucks a full price i bought i paid like 40 bucks for whatever <laughs> I'm, I'm just yeah. hoping nobody notices because I, I refuse to, to uh, I refuse to like take down my Twitter and censor myself. So I'm hoping to get through things without anybody noticing. But um, <laughs> for my classes, I've just been, I've just been submitting sarcastic papers and I, my final paper in my class last semester, it was so sarcastic. I was like, I might, she might actually notice and give me an F. And if she did, I, I, I heard that on the stream and she gave you like, <laughs> yeah. oh, I got 120 out of 120. I got yeah. a perfect score. <laughs> of course. But I was, it was, it was obviously sarcastic. Yeah. I literally wrote, and this was for my scientific research, like this was my evidence-based research, like quantitative analysis type uh, class. I literally wrote, regardless of any data, I have a responsibility to fit um, whatever we uh, whatever we discover to the theoretical back uh, framework that has been established by scholars. Yeah. It's like, and this is science. I'm surprised you didn't get a note. You're not supposed to say the quiet part out loud. That's <laughs> I, I, I yeah. don't you believe in the science? <laughs> Father Stephen, come on. Don't you have faith? I don't, I don't know that the social sciences are actually sciences would be the... <laughs> So Peter Thiel says anything that has the name science in the title is pretending to be a science. Yeah. 
if if it was a science, it wouldn't like biology. There's no biological sciences, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's not physics, chemistry, right? It's political science, computer science, <laughs> social yeah. science. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the, and it's, uh, I don't know, it's this weird, it's this weird middle ground, and I don't understand how you end up there as a person, right? Like, I've explained this to people with the country club analogy, right? So you've got, you've got people on the right who are members of the country club, and they're like, this is good, we've worked all our lives, we're members of the country club, we deserve to be members of the country club. If you're not, you don't deserve it, right? And, and that's fine. Uh, and then you've got like leftists who want to burn down the country club and make it a public park and probably kill the members, right? <laughs> like, that's, and then in between, you have the liberals who are also members of the country club, but feel horrible about it and really wish they'd get some token members to help them feel less bad about it. You know, and are not going to do anything about it. And I don't understand how you end up there as a person. Okay. I don't understand how you can just live in that guilt pathology and not want to escape it to one side or the other. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> so so there, there are several things going on here. Yeah. With the, and, and, like, so... Have you heard of Baptists and bootleggers? That sounds really familiar. So ba Baptists and bootleggers is this economic um, concept of people will say similar things despite the fact that they have completely opposite, They're on opposite side. Motiva yeah. motivations. Right? Um, and so some of it is there are people who are saying things that they absolutely don't believe <laughs> or using, you know, and so you have to, if you are an absolute materialist and this life is all that exists and truth matters to you zero. So some percentage of people are just going to say those things and, Oh, they want to sit in the country club, but it's become fashionable in the country club to, to talk about burning it down. Yeah. And as long as there's no possibility of it being burned Actually down. Actually being burned down, yeah. <laughs> then they will, right? Yeah. So there are some of those people. Yeah. There are a certain number of people who will just say whatever other people say without thinking about it. Yeah. We are not actually computers that if the that you know if the program doesn't run, we'll notice that it doesn't run because we're we're we'll say what we're saying. Um and then there are the people who have really bad theology. <laughs> and this this is actually what Jordan Peterson and, and the Jungians are, are really seeing is that, and I have to say, I mean, I, I do in fact um, blame part of this on the Trinity. I, I say when you, when you start with one equals three, you end up with two plus two equals five. And there's a reason why I will, I, despite the fact that it is against my religion to trespass on other people's religions, I will go full force against Martin Luther because there is a certain theology which leads you down this path where we are, where you start with reason is the horror of Satan and you start with um, the, the, the greatness of the mystery of the Trinity is that we don't understand it. And because we don't understand it, that's what makes it so great. And you start with, um, I, you know, 
lots and lots of bad theology. And by building upon all of this bad theology, even a smart person ends up saying stupid things <laughs> like, oh, well, if, if I confess my sins, that's all I need to do. I don't need to actually do anything about my sins. And yeah, it is, there is a performative, there's a cognitive dissonance that I have in being a white person who, who is leading the synod, but I don't actually need to do anything about it because religiously, all that is required of me is confession and zero repentance. Yeah, I can I can I can go with you on the guilt pathology being closely linked to Western theology, but it has to go back before Martin Luther. Because if you want guilt pathology, Roman Catholicism. Augustine. Yeah. <laughs> like Roman Catholicism is all about like guilt pathology. Okay. What I, what I mean, I tell... Augustine isn't my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> when I tell former Roman Catholics that, like, guilt is useless. Like, guilt is worthless. I know you're Jewish, so you got a little bit of it. But <laughs> well, it depends what you mean by guilt. Right, right. So to me, guilt is feeling bad about yourself based on something you've done or are responsible or per are perceived to have done or are perceived to embody, feeling bad about yourself is not useful because, and I can attest to this as somebody who hears confessions, mm -hmm. people who feel really guilty don't come to confession. They feel horrible about it and that keeps them from coming to confession and trying to work on it. It okay. doesn't spur them to work on it. It okay. doesn't spur them to fix it. Okay, so... <laughs> I, I always default to Hebrew words because I I base it on scripture, right? And um, there are parts of Daniel which have become really integral parts of um, of Jewish prayer. And um, there's a particular chapter that that it forms the basis of selichot, our our um, our penitential prayers that we say. And um, there's a line, Lanu, Lecha Hashem Hatzedaka, the Lanu Boshatapani, right? You, God, have the righteousness, you are correct, and ours is Boshatapani, right? Um, how do you want to translate Boshatapani? The shame of the yeah 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 Sh shame of our face yeah right um and there there is i mean you could identify that with with guilt feeling bad there are things i remember doing there's one particular thing I remember doing that every time I think about it, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to burn for that one. I'm going to burn for that one. And Teshuvah, right? To repent, to turn back, right? To God requires a feeling of disgust at the fact that it was me who did that. And a general repulsion at the fact that that is who I was at that moment. And a, so the word tikva right? Hope has within it kav, line, 
right? Having a hope of aligning yourself, right? A tikva of 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 making yourself more straight, right? Um, we, one of the blessings we say in the morning, uh, blessings that comes from Psalms, Baruch uh, Hashem Elokeinu Melech Haolam, Zokef Kefufim, He who straightens out the crooked, right? And you have to be kaf, kafuf. You have to. You have to recognize your crooked nature for God to straighten you out, right? So repentance is, is incredibly important. And living a life of constant re repentance, right? I think yeah. is, is, Absolutely is agree. what it's all about. But I, don't, but I don't think guilt helps one do that. If, if you've actually repented, if you've gone and actually made things right with the people you've harmed, right? Continuing for the rest of your life to feel guilty about that thing you did is not helpful. And in fact, it's a denial of the forgiveness of God after your repentance. Mm. Um, and I've seen this, I've seen this work in people. My, my sins are before me to, uh, always. Yeah. My, that, that is a, a line from Psalms. And as far as the East is from the West, so far as he removed our transgressions from us is also a line from, <laughs> from the Psalms. <laughs> That's... Sandy asks, is guilt and remorse the same? No. No, no, I'm talking about the ongoing guilt, right? This is, from my perspective, especially after the fact, after repentance. This is where people want to say, oh, the devil comes and tempts me to do this or do that, right? It's like, no, 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 right? Like, I can get into trouble all by myself, right? I can, <laughs> I can sit all by myself. St. James in his epistle says, right, each one is tempted when by his own <laughs> right sinful nature he's dragged away and enticed, right? Not by somebody else, right? I get into trouble myself. Where the devil comes in is after I've repented, the thoughts coming of, no, you know, that's actually who you really are still. Forget about the forgiveness. Forget about doing better. You're the person who did that thing. And you will always be the person who did that thing. And so don't try. Right? Don't. You can't be any better. That's who you are. Right? And to me, that's guilt undermining repentance. Right? I, okay. I, I, don't, I don't think... I. I, uh, I wouldn't even call that guilt. I would call that a denial of God's mercy. Well, that's what it ultimately is. But the feeling, the feeling you have of feeling bad about that thing you did, you know, 25 years ago that you've thoroughly repented of and moved on with your life, what you're feeling, anyone would call that guilt. I still feel uh... horrible about what I did back then. Everyone's forgiven me, and I've done, it, but I still feel horrible. That's the feeling I'm talking about that isn't helpful or useful. I don't know. I, I see. I, I don't agree with that. I I think I think I think my sins are before me always. Um, and see, I interpret that as I keep sinning. But anyway, <laughs> right? no, but not. I'm still worried about the old ones. It's that I keep making new ones. Okay, so so this this was actually a big thing at I, I started yelling at the stage at in Chino because um, because Verbeke was talking. So he has this thing where he says that he wants on his um, toxic shame, 
broad what it says. Um, he, he, he says he wants on his tombstone neither nostalgia nor utopia. Because, and he says he doesn't want to live forever because he knows that he makes mistakes and he can't imagine constantly adding to that history of mistakes, right? And he doesn't want to have this nostalgia, which in a sense just um, does away with the mistakes that he's made. And he doesn't want to have this utopian view uh, that he will one day be without mistakes, right? And therefore, he, he doesn't believe. And he, as he's explaining this, and it was funny, like I started screaming at Paul Vanderplay because I expected him to be the one who could speak about repentance, but he didn't. I screamed at him. I'm like, talk about repentance. And he said, talk about repentance. I, I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean. I just wanted to wring his neck. <laughs> uh, well, it's tough with Calvinism. It, 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 <laughs> no, it works no. a little weird. So, yeah. um, and and Jonathan Pajot, he didn't quite seem to get it either, but he 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 did a better job. But the thing with repentance is that it it redeems your mistakes into wisdom. Yeah. And that's that's what we mean, and I believe this is from the Talmud. It says that repentance makes your sins as if they are merits. Re repentance with through love makes your sins as if they were merits. Right. Because once you have truly repented of that sin, right, and you recognize it for what it was to the degree that you are no longer the person who makes that mistake right then your sin becomes a merit it becomes wisdom you are you are turning lead into gold right but then you don't feel horrible about it See, and you're not saying i'm a horrible person if it really is a merit now right so I, the way the way we tend to talk about this and this is from the orthodox monastic literature is mm -hmm. that uh, things in life are not actually good or bad in themselves. That's a judgment we place upon them. And so nearly anything that happens to us can ultimately, in the long term, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously some things are bad in the moment, right? <laughs> That's right. when they're happening, right? And sometimes for a long time afterwards. But ultimately, in the long term, anything can be good or bad, depending on how we receive it, right? And in terms of how we how we bring it before God, right? So winning the lottery could be the best thing that ever happened to you or the worst thing that ever happened to you, right? Right. And, and, and so even if I fall into egregious sin, hmm. right, if I've truly repented, Right. And found my way out of it. Mm. Right. Through God's working and right. Right. Then after the fact, right, I'm now equipped to help someone else who's struggling with the same thing. Right. I'm now mm. better equipped not to judge someone else who has fallen the way I fell. Right. I'm now better equipped in all these different ways. And that's the wisdom part. Right. That's the. Now I have taken this thing that was bad, mm -hmm. right? And through God turned it into good, right? Joseph getting sold into slavery in Egypt, right? Um, you know. Well, let's talk I, about let's talk about yeah. selling Joseph into slavery. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So remembering my sin and remembering that thing which I did. The fact that, that it pains me is part of what it makes. I mean, 
it is not something that I am forgetting. It yeah. is, and I am, and the fact that, that it pains me is not something that I am forgetting. And the fact that it pains me is what pro keeps me from repeating that mistake. So the pain of that memory is not something, it should remain a painful memory. Well, you shouldn't be happy about it. You should be like, well, yeah, I'm glad I killed that guy, right? That's not, <laughs> okay. what, that's not what I'm saying, right? Right. But saying I'm nothing but a worthless murderer. Right. Like, right. Yeah. I, I agree it's with not you. Not helpful. <laughs> I agree with you, but yeah. I call I call the pain of remembering that act. I would call that more regret. Right? But even regret, even regret at a certain point. Mm. Right? I don't know if you've ever read the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, since we're talking about Joseph being it's, called into it's, slavery. It's on my reading okay. list right here. Okay. I've noticed you but, included it. But, but, of course. You that's, seem to really like that text. It is the most important text that's in that book. Really? Okay. It is the most important Second Temple text for understanding the New Testament. The Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. Okay. Um, a number of the brothers, of course, right, are going back to that moment, right, mm -hmm. in, in, in their testaments. And none of them say, boy, I'm glad I sold my brother into slavery, or boy, I'm glad I was ready to murder my brother, right? Um, but they're at the end of their lives, right, in the way it's portrayed. And they're expressing to their children, right, this is who I was back then, right? And that, that wasn't good. <laughs> right? Don't be like that. But here's what I've learned. Right? From having done that and having repented and seeing what God did through it. And so now here's what I can tell you. Right? About, about your lives going forward. How you can avoid making that mistake. Right? How you can do the opposite. Right? Like if it was out of anger or jealousy. Right? Here's how to avoid anger and jealousy, right? <laughs> you know, um, so that's what I'm getting at in terms of not saying, yeah, it was a great thing that I, you know, did this to my brother, but I can see now over the course of my life how through that God was doing these things, and here's what I learned by having been through it, and so I'm now at a better place. Right and and a place closer to God for having been through that process, mm. right? And and I think if we don't have a thorough going understanding of that, we're not going to have any answer to like Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor, right? Which is basically I don't know if you've read Brothers Karamazov ever, but it's the atheist argument that any moral person would be would be willing to trade their free will to not have all this evil in the world. Right? They would be willing to say, hey, if the cost of all of these horrible things happening is me not having free will, okay, I don't need free will. Right? Mm -hmm. If we don't have that understanding... That get, question gets really hard, but if we do, right, why would God allow us to fall into sin? Why would he allow us to do this evil? Well, if we can take that long view of here's what he's bringing out, of, here's then we have an understanding of why he would do that. And maybe not in every case, maybe not in every detail, right? Not every specific evil thing that happens in the world, right? Because we have a finite perspective. But we can get the gist of Right. What's what's kind of going on there? I think we we generally agree um, about Brothers Karamazov. So yeah. when I was a teenager, um, I got onto a Dostoevsky kick and <laughs> I I was like I was 13, 14. I was reading voraciously Dostoevsky. 
And I barely remember any of it. That's why I just recently bought Crime and Punishment just to read it over again. Because it may be the most formative book in my at, well, in my development I I remember I read it when I was 12 I don't remember it <laughs> yeah any of the details yeah it's yeah. been 35 years almost <laughs> since I read it um, so I was like you know what maybe I need to go back and read it uh, <laughs> but um, no I mean Teshuva is is incredibly important, but part of part of the reason why my I, I really do believe like so Zephaniah three nine is my is kind of my motto. Ki um, Um it, it talks about a pure language, and I believe that Safa Bara is Hebrew. Um, and that's why I do the the Hebrew um, language stuff, is because I think as long as we're, we have to rec- rectify Babel. I think as long as we're talking in different languages, we're speaking in translation, we're not going back to ultimately what I think has to be the Hebrew text. I, 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 I don't see that we can that there can be a true unification of humanity um, and if you want to call it the church. Yeah, the, I mean, this gets into Pentecost and stuff. The second one. No. <laughs> That's, well, no. I mean, in my perspective. So, yeah. no, but yeah. Pentecost in Acts yeah. is, is the Jewish concept of what happened at Mount Sinai. Right. Deliberately so, yeah. Which is, there there was one language, we believe Hebrew, spoken, and everyone... so Everyone understood. Yeah. Everyone understood, right? Yeah. Which is the absolute opposite of how everybody understands speaking in tongues. And I have to... Some I, Protestants. Eh, but, but it's Paul who talks about interpreting tongues. Right. And, and people are overreading that in the modern era. How do you overread interpreting a, Here's how. A, a, the, the miracle word, of, of being able to, under, everybody yeah, able to The word to means language. Okay. He's talking about a Gentile community where there are okay. people who speak all different languages. And he's saying if someone is going to get up and speak in the community in a certain language... They can't do it unless but there's someone who can miracles. interpret that language for everyone else who is there. Hold on. This is 1 Corinthians 12, right? Yeah. And he's he's talking about miracles. He's talking about prophecy and speaking in tongues. Oh, no. The place where he talks about interpretation, he's talking about church order in the assembly when they're gathered together. And saying each one needs to speak separately and take turns. Mm. Not a bunch of people speaking at once. And if there's somebody... Now, if you're talking about gifts, he talks about the gift of tongues and the gift of interpreting tongues, just right. on the list. On the yeah. list, right? And that's just... Some people are really good with languages. And some people aren't. You know, that's <laughs> that's actually how Mormons tra- uh, understand, <laughs> understand the gift of tongues. Yeah. Now, in the Orthodox Church, that's how we've understood it. Uh, other than there are some instances in history where, for example, someone comes to proclaim Christianity to a new group, and even though they don't speak that group's language, those people understand what they're saying anyway. 
So a miracle like the miracle at Pentecost, mm. right? But glossolalia, right? The the yeah, speaking languages that nobody knows. That's not the historic interpretation of those at all. The only place where you can kind of get that from the original mm. in St. Paul is that one place where in the list of things where, you know, if I do this, if I do that, if I do the other, <laughs> but don't have love, right. right? For God or my brother, then I'm nothing. And he mentions it there. Even if I speak in the tongue of men and angels, right? they say, aha, see the language of angels. Aha, right? And, but that's taking that way out of context, right? From the point he's making, mm. right? His point that he's making is even if I have all of this earthly wisdom and all of this heavenly wisdom, but I don't love God and don't love my brother, I'm, I'm nothing, right? I, I have to say the fact that um, that some of my good friend Christian friends speak in tongues is one of the scariest things in the world to me because I have not been able to find any biblical just of way in which it is anything but uh, other than demonic. Yeah. The only the only thing I can think of in the Hebrew Bible that's remotely, remotely close, close is uh, is Saul also among the prophets? Remember when he goes into the city? And... Nah, is for girls. Remember? I, oh, I, I don't know okay. why not. So, <laughs> when Saul was looking for David, <laughs> right? Uh, and he went to find Samuel. He went into the, the city of the prophets. Right. And when he goes into the city of the prophets, like the spirit of God hits him and he rips off all his clothes and is rolling around on the ground prophesying. Okay. And they say, this is where the saying comes from, is Saul also among the prophets? Which is a saying I'd never heard anywhere, but apparently was a saying at the time. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, I'm like, that's the closest thing I could find to what goes on at Pentecostal churches in the, in the Hebrew Bible. And I don't think that's a good proof text for it. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. It happened to sort of stop Saul from committing murder, right? Like, it's not like... Uh, uh, honestly, like, I, I, I have to start reading more of Nah. Because the, you know what stops me is every time I start reading it in English, it, it doesn't work, and I have to start reading it in Hebrew. Yeah. And when I start reading it in Hebrew, it's it's so much more slow. Yeah. Yeah. The only problem with reading it in Hebrew is part of First Samuel is kind of a mess in the Masoretic text. A lot of, I mean, and like. It's not a the text it itself, is, it's the Masura. It's the, yeah. A lot of it is using, I, I mean, all kinds of words that, it's it's not like the Torah in, in, in its Hebrew. Yeah. Well, because it's yeah. from across a, this, a vaster swath of time. Much vaster. Yeah. And then there's <laughs> there's the Aramaic words. And Aramaic then, stuff and other yeah. loan words and things that show up, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Ecclesiastes has a couple Persian words in it. That are on loan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and then like especially the wisdom stuff, you you read a verse and then you have to start digging into it and thinking about it. And oh yeah. yeah. You get to some kind of read through Proverbs. It's just like you know. I honestly don't know if I've if I if I have read everything in the Bible. I I may have, I may not have, but like the number one thing I tell people who tell me, oh, I have such a hard time reading the Bible is don't, it's not a book. Yeah. It's not a book you open up and you read through. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on page 573. Yeah, exactly. Like, is, that's not how I can't it wait works. to see how it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say a lot of, a lot of Christians will kind of say to me, yeah, like you read it and then like the gospels are like a continuation. I'm like you're making it sound very linear. And it's well if 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 you're a, if you're a Protestant, there's that big gap too. In between right. <laughs> right? Malachi and, and Matthew. 
where all yeah. of a sudden these Pharisees and Sadducees and stuff come into existence and synagogues and <laughs> all of these things you've never read about in the. Uh... So I, I, I don't know if you heard me say this, and I, I am going to end the stream soon. Sure. But um, I don't know if you heard me say this, but there were there are a lot of things that when I was discussing with Christians, I wouldn't bring up because I know they're not from the Bible. And so I figured there's no reason for Christians to believe it. But then I started reading the Gospels and the Epistles and, and, of uh, Paul and stuff. And it's like, well, it's not in my Bible, but it's in your Bible. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the, all the, th I mean, St. Paul does that all the time. He just drops this stuff in, you know, as when Moses contested with Janice and Jambres, you know. Yeah. Don't and and it's like, is. wait. Okay, what is that? The names what? of Pharaoh's magicians. Oh. Yeah, okay. it's in Yumbers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> and it's like, what? Or, you know, you skip over like, Israel had a rock that followed them in the wilderness. Right. <laughs> it's like, wait. The rock of Miriam. Right, That's exactly. The problem here. <laughs> but the Torah doesn't actually say it followed them, right? Okay. Like, <laughs> that's you go to the midrash and it's like oh yeah they sang this song and the rock picked up and it moved right? <laughs> like, but say paul's just like casually referring to this stuff right like that to me is more evidence that he's the pharisee is that he knows about this uh, stuff you're, right? you're the first one to bring this stuff up because i i, I am going to have to look because yeah. honestly i i have honestly issued this challenge to people just <laughs> tell me why you think Paul is a Pharisee, other than the supposed he identifies point. as a Pharisee. Yeah. yeah, it's like, like just, just give me like yeah. some indication. And the like, resurrection refers to extra biblical Jewish traditions casually, without explanation. Okay, uh, I'll, 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 I'll have to, I'll have to take a look at that. <laughs> okay, I am going to end this okay. broadcast because this, this. It is 11 o'clock here at 1 a.m. where you are? Yeah, about. Yeah, okay. I am going to end this broadcast.